What's up, guys? It is Modern Craftsman Monday, and this week we have Guillermo from CNS Drywall. He is in Oahu, Hawaii, uh, which is exactly why we have him on this podcast. This is, uh, you know, a part of the country that we have no real understanding of. Do you know that they don't have wildlife there? Listen, (laughs) I may have made a silly comment about wildlife. You guys can. I'm just glad it wasn't me. I'm pretty sure uh, someone's gonna comment and be like, "Nick is definitely right." That's. That is your wife doesn't count. She she is not going to comment. Either way, guys, (laughs) we're talking about Hawaii and the industry out there, obviously, specifically around drywall. um, But we really dig into it, especially the last 20 minutes. I think we uh, we hit we hit a few really great topics. We hit the union versus residential. That is true. No. And, you know, the the benefits, you know, some of the downsides. But we also, you know, I think the biggest thing is really the education. Yeah. Make sure you guys listen. And then at the very end of this podcast. Uh, we have a special guest on who's going to be talking about our great event that's coming up December 12th. So Less than a month away. Three weeks, and we're halfway to our goal. Going to be some fancy trucks there. Hawaii's pretty, I mean, it's, uh, it's a beautiful melting pot going back to the culture. Um, like growing up, my five best friends um, – they're all mixed plate down here. They call it mixed plate, meaning a lot of different nationalities. So, um, Caucasian, African American, Tongan, uh, Filipino, Fijian, uh, Puerto Rican, Swiss. It's just it's a beautiful melting pot. But um, which island are you I, on? I live on Oahu, which is kind of like the LA of the bunch. Uh, is this that where is Honolulu where, is? Yeah, Honolulu. Okay. Um, this is where majority of the building takes place. Um, but yeah, the market the market is 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 killer compared to a lot of other places from the guys that I talk to online. It's just like you like you said, everything is simple mm-hmm. but super expensive. What's like super the expensive? average the average medium home down here is around eight hundred thousand dollars. So eight hundred thousand yeah. dollars, you're not getting a brand new house. You're getting a single wall house from like the seventies, maybe eighties with a Koenig ceiling, not even drywall. So Koenig is like a thick uh, cardboard that they would use back in the day that substitutes drywall. It's what? like a thick thick cardboard that the backside is kind of like insulated. So that that's it. That's the only thing separating you indoors from your plywood on the roof. So it's, it's just crazy how much the housing is just – just super high down here is that so right that, around honolulu or is that across the entire island oh well, that's just on the if you're if you get the medium for the the island of oahu mm-hmm. it's eight hundred thousand. but is yeah. it more expensive to, the closer you get to the city like it yeah is so here? the closer you get to town the more traffic you hit but the nicer views you know it's closer to waikiki which is you know that's like the main uh tourist spot here on the island um, you go down a little bit further down towards Kahala, Hawaii Kai, then you're already like in the million dollar range, you know, easy and for an old home, a new build. Uh, it's going to be an easy over a million if you build in that, that portion of the island, that part of the island. But I mean, uh, it's, it, I think it's kind of like the price for paradise. You know, that's what, that's what we say down here. Uh, the price for good weather and a uh, surf. <laughs> so you said that you you when I spoke with you earlier that basically you were kind of born and raised there but you moved from somewhere else. Did you move from somewhere else in Hawaii? Uh no, so we moved out here when I was about 5 years old. Uh, my dad would work uh drywall in California and it slowed down a little bit there and he was uh he actually came to the islands back in the 60s when he was younger. So uh, he has a family down here that uh, one of the uncles used to be a general contractor. Uh, he called them up. He said, oh, there's work down here. Come down. So he came down here for a couple months. He liked it. Uh, work was pretty steady. And we ended up all moving down here. And the rest is history. We just stayed down here. And I pretty much, I mean, I travel back and forth to California because that's where I met my <laughs> wife. But um, Hawaii, I just, uh, there's no place like it, man. Yeah, I've never been. John, have yeah. you been? <laughs> I haven't been. Well, it's cheap. I, round trip. Round trip is about uh, six hundred bucks if you get it on the uh, uh, special time of the year. Yeah, 
And I mean, everything is uh, food and everything is pretty much a um, little cool. bit more expensive than Los Angeles. Gas is actually a little cheaper down here than California for some reason. But other than that, I mean, it's not too, too expensive to, to visit. And if you're an outdoors type of person, it's the perfect place to come down and just cruise. Yeah, so you don't remember living in California at all or barely? Uh, barely. I mean, um, since I, I met my wife down there while I was on vacation, um, I tried working there for about four months just to get a feel of it, see if, uh, you know, we could potentially raise a family down there. But just the price in, in wages is just ridiculous, like the difference between what you would get paid down here if you have the right connections to down there. So the cost of living is more in Hawaii, you think, than L.A.? Uh, depends. I, I think if you live like in, you know, like the, uh, closer to L.A., you know how crazy some of the housing is down there, too. But uh, overall, I think Hawaii is just more expensive all around, you know. But you can uh, make from, more money working where you are now then. Exactly. So with the right connections, if you have the right clientele, you can make, uh, <laughs> I want to say, a better living down here um, than down there. But like, it all goes back to, you know, who your clientele is and what kind of in you have in the industry. But a uh, perfect example is down here, a journeyman gets, uh, I think, in the union, they get about 45 bucks take home, uh, about, I think about $4 vacation that is non-taxable, and then about $9 retirement. So wow. if you add that That's up drywall. to- That's drywall, journeyman drywall? Uh, finisher. So taper drywallers, I think in the end of five years, they're going to be making close to $60 an hour down here from what, um, the last union meeting said. So there's two different unions, uh, in drywall. If you're doing it like specifically for the union, mm -hmm. there's, uh, the carpenters union. They're, they're in charge of putting up the sheets and fireproofing and all of that good stuff. Um, and then there's, uh, painters union which is also part of the tapers union which is the finishing side of the drywall so the mudding and you know making it look nice for the painters to come in but the, the, you're talking specifically commercial correct yeah specifically commercial so uh, before i branched out and got licensed on my own i was in the union for about 16 years uh i've been on my own now for about three what drove, um, what drove you to start your own company I mean, it's, the pay is really good. The package is really good. But just like anywhere, um, it's super hard to find a company that's going to keep you busy throughout the year. You know, uh, here in Hawaii, more and more, we're seeing a lot of high rises go up. So what that means is the investors that come from out of state, uh, they want this built fast to maximize their profits. So you're looking at a high rise go up rather than back in the day when it took years. It, it comes up in months. And that, that's pretty funny because it goes up, but then, um, I mean, one of the most expensive high rises to be built here in Honolulu to date right now is facing a lot of lawsuits. Um, I think they're suing the general contractor for a lot of, um, they're saying they didn't follow codes or, you know, a lot of things are failing, um, in the, in that high rise, there's, there's a lot of issues that are coming up. So I think that, that, you know, that, that ties in directly with just the push that they're that they're putting on those buildings like just on the finishing side that high rise i think at one point had close to 45 guys just on the taping side wow, so crazy. if you add the tapers to the drywallers you're looking at you know easy close to 100 if you're if you're counting all the the super supervisors you know right. project managers everybody on site just on drywall alone and that that's pretty insane you know but you're seeing that more and more. So um, you get overtime, you know, work 10 hour days, seven days a week, and then, you know, for four or five months and then boom, nothing. Right. That's and always when you go surfing, right? <laughs> yeah. You go surfing, but you're forced <laughs> to just pretty much collect unemployment, right? But you collect unemployment and what? You just wait. You, you wait for the rest of the half year, you know? There's a lot of people who are going to listen to this and be like, yo, I'm moving down there. I'm going to learn how to finish drywall, <laughs> work seven days a week, 10-hour days, and then yeah. just get laid off and collect unemployment. And go yeah. surfing. 
yeah. and go surfing. You, but you, like, you do that here as landscapers in the winter. <laughs> right. You guys have a way better environment. They than just hang. go snowboarding, you know? <laughs> yeah. not surfing. And that's cool, like, if you don't have a family, you know, like, if you're a right. single guy. But if you have a family and you have, you know, uh, rent, mortgage, all of that, you, you just can't, you can't survive off of just responsibility. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's funny because John and I just had a conversation, not directly related to that, but today that there's a completely different mindset when you have life responsibilities versus, you know, you're at an age or in a position where you don't necessarily have to work because somebody's picking up the pieces. Mm. Um, and like, even I know beyond a lot of financially, like, it's yeah, not just financially, yeah. just like keeping your life together beyond that. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. like, I know a lot of people who would completely dig what you're saying right now, but then <laughs> people like us look and it's like, realistically, you'd have the time off and you'd just be like, I need more money. I need to land a job. Yeah. I need like, yeah. it's just craziness. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've never, I, I was never in the union, but that's <laughs> been a common, you know, complaint right is that the consistency it's like it's really busy you make a lot of money the the packages are good but as soon as you know there's not work it's just you're you know you gotta sit you gotta wait and yeah i knew a lot of guys that were in going in like the position you were in where it's you were doing that and then you were waiting and then finally you just said i'm speaking for you but you, you started your own thing because you weren't going to play the waiting game yeah, exactly. I mean, for some, it's kind of like the luck of the draw, honestly, because I know guys, you know, like my brother's in the union. He's been in the same company for about eight years. But they do you think on... it's, do you really think it's luck or do you think he works incredibly hard to the point where they, they don't let him go because he's their quote unquote top guy? Or is it, or is it the opposite where they're taking advantage of a situation where give us the answer pretending he's not going <laughs> to listen to this <laughs> no i mean it's a it's 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 a little bit of both because luck put him in that in that uh company because the way it works is if i get laid off i'm going to go on a list and uh that list is kind of like a list that nobody gets to see besides uh, the union office and what they'll do is uh they'll They'll base it off, well, it's supposed to be based off the guys that got laid off the earliest, you know, kind of like to keep that, that revolving door going. So guys that just got laid off can stay on the bench a little longer compared to the other guy that's been there for, you know, a couple months waiting for work. So uh, he got placed in there by luck. But I think, I think because of his hard work and just, you know, just his willingness to, to go that extra mile is the reason they, they keep him. But um yeah, it just it, it's it's a lot of various things because also there's there's been companies where you know there are solid guys that work nonstop and they're good workers, but then the guy the the guy that's in charge his nephew gets laid off or whatnot from a different company. He calls up his uncle, and of course uncle is going to take care of the nephew. So then, even though that guy that was there working really hard, showing up extra early, going the extra mile, he's eventually going to get laid off because you know the the uncle is going to take care of his boy his his sure his nephew you know i think a lot of well, union guys that are successful it's it's multiple generations where yeah. i have buddies that are in the 537 pipe fitters union that like their parents were in it and they ran companies so yeah, uncles exactly. everybody's all involved so it's like when they would switch companies this entire family chain tree would just remove themselves from one company <laughs> yeah, and yeah, go to another. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of crazy that way that I would yeah. know what any other company would have, any other business would ever do that. Like, yeah. We're talking but, um, seven to 10 family members. Would just like leave. you hear uncle oh, Jay yeah. left. All right, let's go. Yeah, it's, yeah. Oh, you treated him like <laughs> crap. See ya. Right. The yeah, whole family yeah. goes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it makes sense. You know, that's just how it is. That's the, that's just, um, the reality of it. But, um, uh, besides that, I wanted to generate something more, you know, I didn't want to just, I mean, I love the union. The wages are awesome. Benefits are amazing. You know? Well, let um, me pause, let me pause you for a second. The beyond that, the education, you know, I think that's something that, you know, non-union, you know, lacks is the education where they, they have some, and training. Yeah, and training, right? Like, there's all these training. Like, we, I drive by the Carpenters Training Center every day in the city. It's right down the street from my house. And yeah. it's for the union car. I always go by and it's always empty. I'm <laughs> always like, dude, that's cool. That's a it. cool spot. 
<laughs> but but speak to that a little bit. Like, what was the training? Like, you're not just being thrown in the field and expecting to learn by the guy that's working beside you. You're you're actually taking some formal training. Is that correct? It's a baseline, right? Yeah. So there's uh the nowadays they changed it. Before they would hold it on Saturdays. It'd be about an eight hour class for four years. Uh, but now they changed it. I think uh, it falls on a weekday. So you have to work your full eight hours, and then you go to you go to class two times a week, I think, um, for a total of four years. And uh, if you're in the carpenters union, they'll teach you how to do layout, you know, framing, uh, grid ceilings, all of that fun stuff. And on the finisher side, they, they'll teach you how to use the, the spray rig, um, you know, a bunch of safety classes because it's all it all has to be OSHA certified and all of that. Um, but yeah, they, they want to make sure that the guys that they're putting out on the field that are getting paid all that money, uh, are fairly prepared, you know, mm -hmm. not just like, Oh, they just, cause even if you're, you're, uh, uh straight out of high school and you join the union, uh, you're going to get paid more than any minimum wage job out here. So the guys on site are paying you close to 20 bucks an hour. They, they want you to produce, out the gate. You know what I mean? They don't want to be wasting time trying right. to teach you so that you need to at least know some aspects of the work. So a lot of the guys that, that, uh, their apprentices, they actually go to classes before they even get placed on the job. So they're not super green and, you know, potentially a uh, safety hazard, you know, I think that's huge. Uh, and that's where I think we're, you know, we're lacking. Like I have a couple of my guys that have reached out and they, and they've asked, they said, Hey, listen, like, I'd like to take class to learn this, to, to help yeah, speed up yeah. my, the process in, in learning. And I think that's amazing. It's just something that we don't offer besides the informal, like, Hey, you know, North Bennett, I know. And it's, I mean, do, how do I, like, how do I roll that into a package? Right. Like I'm speaking for our company. I'm not saying yeah, it. I don't, I don't know. How John's like, John's like, customers are something that, that you would just do. For them to go to school. I mean, it's. I mean, I know we offered. This is completely different tangent, but like Hunter, the kid that was a college kid that's worked two summers for us, and whenever he comes back, he's going to I think like Stonehill or something, and he doesn't really know what his major is going to be. So we're like, hey, if you want, when you come back and you graduate, we'll put you at Wentworth at nights, mm -hmm. and if you get a B or higher, we'll pay for that that class or the, those well, that's classes. Exact, I mean, that's exactly that's what we're right. offering. Yeah. I don't know how we're going to figure it out. Right. But it, like, I would, I would take ta Tanner and I know you're listening to this and I know you're going to text me immediately saying, yeah. So what about that North Bennett? Streaming? Don't, don't text them. Make but, them wait. <laughs> but he, but he, he wants to, and he's like, I, I want to do the, the, the North Bennett street. And I'm like, so explain to Guillermo what North Bennett street is. So it's the, he probably doesn't know. Yeah. It's, um, the oldest carpentry, or vocational, vocational trade school in America. Uh, but it's oh. very, you know, preservation carpentry, carpentry, cabinet making, book binding, violin building. Like, Everything. Basically, you know, they, they give you the, the full gamut, similar to what you're saying about the unions that they're going to start you off. But, but it's like voluntary. They, yeah, they'll build a shed and they'll build every component of it, and roof it, oh, trim it, awesome. the whole nine. And then they'll do stairs, they'll do cabinetry. Um, not in the order I think it would go. Like, it's like... <laughs> No, it's kind of at least from what yeah. I've seen outside looking in. Yeah, it's like well, you're paying you're paying to go to school there, right? Yes. You're paying where it's that's oh, where okay. I think the union. Does yeah, really the union well. is like, free, so yeah. they, they. I mean, it's they mandatory. I remember. Yeah, it's mandatory. Yeah. I remember working with some of these guys, and it's like I gotta go. Like I'm out of here at three. I got class, and it's you know, and they were on a schedule, and that was you know how they. It's also how you're graded at or paid. Like, you know, you finish a certain amount of hours of school and in field training, your your pay changes and you become the yeah, journeyman. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um so what, go ahead. what you're still in the you said you're a union member now? Yeah, so I'm kinda like in that perfect sweet spot where um I continue to be a union member because of the packages. So last year I was uh on site supervisor for a couple of the the jobs that commercial jobs and I was doing my company at the same time. I had a lead guy that I would leave in charge and, you know, kind of just do both. And it got a little bit too crazy. So this year I kind of stepped down. I haven't gone back to work a union job, but um, 
I haven't done any commercial work. So we do pretty much all residential. And that's why I say I'm in that sweet spot because the second I try to bid on the bigger jobs that come down my way, uh, it's going to be an issue with the union mm -hmm. because I'm taking work away from them. But there's no way that they can compete with the residential wages because you can't go up to a random local guy and say, hey, I want close to $100 an hour per guy and I still have to make profit on top of that hundred dollar package. You know that the union has to pay uh, us pretty much. So there's no, there's no way that we can compete, uh, that they can compete with, with our lower prices on the residential side. And there's uh, nobody's going to be willing to pay the commercial price for a home. You know what I mean? So even if they were will say if price aside, would a union do a residential project? It's hard. I've talked to the union president on several occasions and we've had that debate where do you think the union members would work for a lower wage? No, and, wait, but wage like would oh, yeah. could you oh, okay. hire a union carpenter carpentry company to frame one of your houses? I think it would be all price point. Yeah, I mean, price I think, aside, well, though, I, you were looking at a union site guy at some point John or demolition was it? I can't remember. It might have been I, for some reason, they do both. I guess in my mind, I thought that you they they wouldn't work. In I mean, we did that we like did, private residence. But we did the um, well, it's different. We did the mall. And it was it was a um, harmony job, which yeah. was both unit right. and residential. So I mean, I think you could if like if, if you, you were if you were willing to pay, pay the wages, it. yeah, they, they would come and build the frame a house. Absolutely. I got my buddy yeah. who does refrigeration. He does residential rinks. There's certain towns that have people put rinks up in their backyard. Yeah. They go and do the refrigeration for those rinks in people's certain backyards. Towns. That doesn't happen down in Hawaii. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, if they're willing to pay the price, then, of course, uh, the union. I mean, there has been some some uh, times where I, I've i worked a residential home, but you're talking about mansions now, sure. you know, where money's not an issue. But if yeah, have you're you regular, seen Nick's jobs? <laughs> Well, that. <laughs> so have you seen Nick's jobs? <laughs> yeah, so if it's like that, then uh, of course. But uh, if you're a regular homeowner and you know you're trying to renovate, and you bought a house that's eight hundred thousand dollars, and you want to renovate that house, you're gonna have to sure. spend another two hundred thousand. You know, you're gonna have to try budgeting because everything here is more expensive. Like drywall, for example. I did a little uh, inquiry last week just to ask the guys how much, uh, you know, a four by 12 sheet was where they're at here in Hawaii. If you go to home Depot, a four by 12 half inch sheet is going to cost you around $32. Oh man. It's like double. I'll go back to that cardboard stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, everything's just more expensive. So when it comes to drywall, I think um, even though it's a finished product, a lot of homeowners kind of kind of budget want to budget the most um so i think that's the main reason we do majority i mean 90 percent of our homes are texture just because it's a faster quicker turnover that's spray, uh, than, right? than, than level four or level five smooth finish so and you're that, taping everything and then spraying a texture yeah so we'll we'll hang the board insulate hang the board give it two coats a nice touch up sand and then give it a nice orange peel texture you guys are insulating? That's part of your scope? Yeah. So we insulate, hang, and tape. And then we also do uh, exterior EFIS work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's, what's so that's your... what we do throughout the year. I forget. What is the temperature swing out there? Here, it gets uh, perfect. Yeah, I know. It's like right now, it's actually been a little bit harder this year, but it averages around 89, 90, and then it won't drop. It won't drop lower than... Um, I want to say 70 throughout the day. I knew it was going to And I'm talking like, like early morning in December. When you know, they're warming their car up. Yeah, when it's, when it's our winter. When it's our winter type of thing. Auto you know, start. So it's, it's beautiful weather throughout the year. But so insulation is not that big a deal, but water is a big no. deal. Like when you guys get rain, uh, it rains hard. Yeah. So, um, yeah, insulation Well, for the walls, it's required to do R13. And then the ceilings, you can either go all the way up and you'll do R19 or leave it right behind the drywall and it's R30. And that's it. No vapor board, none of that stuff, just yeah. straight up. Um, and then you're, you're good to hang right over that. 
So Nick, you said that the that when you went there, the houses seemed small to you. Am I wrong? Yeah, it was just it, what I'm going to try it again. What attracted me to Hawaii and what made me because I've never in my life said I would move somewhere. And when I left there, I was like, I would move there if my if I wanted to change my life because I felt like everything was just simpler. The homes they the detail didn't I feel like that's matter as much. I go. <laughs> but it just it, it 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 was more about living a relaxed lifestyle, being on the beach, being with your family. Like the homes just didn't seem to have this oh, like they weren't overly detailed. Mm. But at the same time, I was in part of Oahu, and it could have been a part that was that was the neighborhood. And then we went to Maui, and yeah. you know, but and I remember being it was odd. I, I was yeah, in, it's 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 humid down here. Like throughout the year, it's humid, but you kind of get used to it. But Guillermo, do you feel like a lot of houses getting built now are smaller because of the cost of products? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. So the the scale. So this year, this year, I think I, we've we've done a little bit over thirty homes. Out of those thirty homes, only two of them were like huge level five type of builds that you would call more like uh, custom. You know, where they're they're gonna spend more of the money. And those were both beachfront. So that's where you'll get the nice, you know, overly complicated homes, beachfront mm-hmm. homes. Uh, other than that, majority of them are kind of like cookie cutter homes. They're all package deal homes where. What's the square uh, footage of, of these two different homes that you, the coastal and then your uh, package? The one, one of them was right on the beach in Lanikai, which is pretty much one of the most expensive spots here on the island. Uh, that one was about 400 sheets. So, uh, 400 four foot by sheets. 12 sheets, four by 12. So 400, uh, 400 times 48, 20,000. So that's, that ceiling and walls. That, that was the square footage for drywall for that one. And the so other one about was 6,000 square foot house. Yeah. So yeah. So size of house is about 6,000. Yeah. Yeah. That's what my sheets yeah. are. Yeah, and the other one was uh, the other one was fairly uh, pretty much the same, but uh, just um, laid out a little differently. But that one was on the opposite side of the island in North Shore, uh, beachfront so, as well. So the cookie cutter homes, you know, they're probably not six thousand square feet. Are they, where are they at? Uh, no, actually, some of them are. Um, wow. For a while, what, what what the trend that was going on here in the island is. Um, there's a lot of, since everything's so expensive, right? So a lot of people were building with uh, um, keeping in mind that, okay, we're going to build this gigantic monster home and three different or two different uh, generations are going to live in there. So uh, what would happen is, you know, the brother and his family on one side and then the sister and her family on the other side of this huge house. Mm -hmm. So it was happening so often um, that the state actually passed a no monster home law, I think like last year, is that where how, they're restricting that. Yeah, is that what they call it? Is that how they wrote it? Yeah, monster homes, exactly. That's, that's what awesome. they called it. Yeah, because yeah. they're creating <laughs> monsters by putting yeah. family. Ma- I would never. That's like my worst nightmare to live with my family. Yeah, so I mean, but sometimes <laughs> approaching sometimes, the holidays, you know, what's up, whether fam? it's necessity or you know, like let's say your parents are getting old and. You know, uh, they need someone to take care. So if there's enough money in the equity or whatever to build a brand new house in the back, you leave them in their original house and you live in the back, take care of them, you know. So there's a lot of different situations, but it was happening so often that um, mainly because of traffic, you know, if there's 10 cars to one house and the roads here in Hawaii aren't built for that, there's no street parking, (laughs) you know, it's just, you know, super cramped depending on what part of the island we're talking about. But, uh, yeah, so, yeah, surprisingly, a lot of these uh, cookie cutter homes, package deal homes are fairly big mm-hmm. as well, you know. But it's just a faster turnover, the products that go in. No, it's TRU. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Sorry. We're- yeah, so- I was trying to think of who else in Hawaii besides Dog the Bounty Hunter and oh. <laughs> Roseanne, who lives out there. I, I used to follow, what, Truth yeah. Excavation? Yeah, he's on Maui, I think. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, that's who I he's first. A, he's, a, he's a funny individual. Yeah, Truth We should actually have him on. Um, I know you're not a GC, but I, I remember t- t- going back to that kid that we met in Las Vegas last year. 
you know, he was talking about how complicated it is to build there. And he was the one that had mentioned that water is a big issue and rain and controlling that. But I remember you got, it's the, even the framing is very different. I think you guys, is it, you guys are using like a special treated lumber or something? I thought it was bamboo, no? Isn't it? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, so yeah. So down here, like the older homes were all redwood. And I think one of the main reasons for that is because uh, there's so much ground termite down here. That's what it is. That yeah. if you're not careful, you know, within a couple of years, all that framing, all that new wood is just, it, it they're aggressive. They it's will, treated, you know, right? eat it's you like out of hole. or something. Yeah, so it's treated. All of it is treated. Uh, so every time you cut a piece or whatever, you have to treat it before it gets nailed on. So it's a different process, I guess, just because of the, the so does that, termites does that, here. Does that lead to a lot more steel framing, like gauge metal? Uh, shucks, that can get kind of tricky too. Like maybe three weeks ago, we, we renovated a beachfront home. The the EFIS on the outside, there was a vent. And this home isn't even like, Maybe it's about, I want to say, five, 600 feet away from the beach. It was on a cliff. So you would assume that a lot of salt water and all of that doesn't really reach it. But uh, through that vent in the, the soffit, the steel um, metal framing got rusted out. It rusted out the screws, and wow. it made two full sheets of EFIS just sag and drop. <laughs> and all, all just through uh, the moisture and the salt water in there that got into it. So I don't know if that was uh, because they used the wrong screws on mm -hmm. the metal stud and it started where the screw penetrated the stud and it kind of just, you know, right. spider webbed out or if the concentration of salt water there just started to rot away because the, it only rotted where the soffit was pretty much the rest of the metal stud was good, but that soffit area just sure. all of that was gone and it caused everything to just, you know, sag and replace. So what we did is the homeowner wanted to just cancel out that soffit and we just, uh, sister joined some, uh, treated lumber mm -hmm. that kind of, so it won't happen again. Um, so with, but, with cost of materials and then dealing with the, the severe termite issues, obviously I think that sounds like more of a rare case with the, the metal framing and the rotting metal, but what other, you know, in, I'm, I'm going to lean probably towards more of the, the track homes or the cookie cutter homes. Are these ho are these homes being built for longevity? Is there a lot of thought into that or is it, are they, is it still kind of a uh, copy and paste game? Uh, depends on the, on the project site, but honestly, I think a lot of these are kind of just, you know, maximize the profit because uh, what we're trying, what we're starting to see more and more here on the island is foreign investors. So, you know, a lot of the times when it's foreign investors, it's not local. Mm -hmm. They're not really worried about longevity. Sure. They're worried about more the upfront profit and, you know, the quicker turnover and all that. So, um, yeah, I think it really depends on the builder and, you know, just what, what your, Kind of like what your your market is in a sense, because if, if it's cookie cutter, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, these houses are going to last at least 30 years, I want to say. But are you building them to withstand 100 years? Sure. Probably not, you know, because of the material that's used and just the environment that we live in. So to, to speak to your trade and what you're, you know, what you're trying to bring to your industry, right? You know, you're, yeah. do, you're doing some of the custom homes, the beachfront homes, and you're also doing some of the cookie cutter you know, how does that play a role? Because I, I would assume that you're, you know, beyond just the texture, right? You're, you're, you're doing textured in the lower, the uh, lower dollar, dollar homes where you're doing level five and the other. Are you trying to cater your, your company towards more level five projects, or is the market not there? Um. Yeah. So my goal is to slowly become a union company. You know, we want to kind of cross that threshold that was into, <laughs> no into, into commercial. Okay. That's the end game because in all honesty, I think that's where, um, I think that's where the fun is. You know, I enjoy, uh, intricate, uh, custom, you know, while I was in the union last year, while I was still working with them, we did uh Tiffany's down in Waikiki. That was 
a huge pain in the butt, but it, it was a lot of awesome custom, some Venetian plaster ceilings, a lot of archways, you know, as far as the finishing goes and all that. But um, uh, I, that that is a little bit more interesting. Uh, sure, it's going to take longer, but also the the price is there. You know, you can bid it accordingly. It's going to take you a couple months, but you can also, uh, I think, maximize your profits and also enjoy something different than just, you know, just in and out, in and out. Because these track homes that we're talking about will insulate, hang, and tape them in about seven days. So we're in and we're out, you know. It's fast, in and out, in and out. But uh, the more intricate projects, commercial side, those take months. You know, there's a lot of, a lot, a lot more stuff that goes into it that makes it a little bit more, um, in a sense, desirable. But also, it's a little bit more of a headache. You know, a lot more red tape, especially if it's commercial here. Um, there is a lot of rules, a lot of stuff you have to follow. You know, um, from switching over from a from a residential to a commercial job. There's just way more stuff that you have to account for and worry about. And sure. So you would just be finishing if you went commercial, strictly commercial with the union, right? Uh, no, I would want to, I would want to have a fairly small, start off small, but do the, you know, everything from the non-structural framing to putting the drywall up, grid ceiling, um, and finishing all of that. So you'd have to have car, because you said that's part of the hanging the board would be part of the carpenters union. Yeah, yeah. So you'd have to get uh, I'd have to get a uh, certified in a couple of other things, uh, depending on that, or bring someone on board that already has that license, you know, partner up or or whatnot, like the other companies have have done here. What on do the you island. think's the smallest that you could be while still going union? Like how many employees? Uh shucks, I think. I mean, I've been in companies in the union that have maybe like 15 employees. I mean, you're counting the, the guys at the office and, you know, hangers and tapers, and finishers. But so I, don't think I, think, I don't think the quantity plays a role in that, right? No, I think I, I think to some point it does, but it, it it's more, I think, uh, how much um, – how much capital you have, how much are you willing, you know, cause commercial jobs, uh, they're going to hold up. They're going to tie up a lot more of your money than these, you know, sure. fast cookie cutter homes. So I think, uh, I think it's the capital along with, you know, how much guys you have. And, and mainly it's, for me, it's acquiring the right um, general contractors that are consistently building, you know, uh, these commercial projects and, uh, ultimately, that's what it is, you know, because you, you don't want to go union, uh, do one project, and then you got to tell all your boys they got used to the, you know, 40, that, that pay bump. Oh, you know what, guys, we're going to have to drop back down to what we were at because uh, we don't have any more union jobs. It's going to be residential from now on, you know, so you need to have that that connection, I think. What Besides that, what what are the steps in becoming union? Uh, just that, and then you sit down with the, the the union and you work out a deal as far as um, what you're going to pay, you know, because uh, the company has to pay a percentage for it to become union, and then the union members themselves pay a percentage off their paycheck to the, the union. So Dude. this needs to be... Dues. What's that? Their dues. Their dues. The dues, So it yeah. really needs to be a company-wide decision. Like the employees kind of have say in it. Uh, yeah. In so a, like, let's say, it, yeah, right. in a way. So let's say I get a big, um, a big Davis bacon job on, on the military base that is going to, you know, last for seven months, you know, that would be enough to be like, okay, guys, you know, we're going to roll the dice and we're going to unionize. So I would bring everybody that currently works for me. We'd go in and we'll, we sort it out. You know what I mean? And then uh, my question that comes up is, so you went through all that training to become like a journeyman, you know, taper and hanger. What's that do for the guys that are in your company that haven't gone through that education? Do they just get adopted in? How does that work? Uh, they would have to kind of, I think they would, they would do like some type of tests from the union head, you know, the presidents and whatnot for them to gauge what percentage to bring them in as, Okay. you know what I mean? So if, if they're not a uh, journeyman level, then they'll gauge like, okay, you're only 65%. You still got, you, you know, we'll bring you in at 65. You still got to do the four years of training or whatnot. 
So I think it, it, it goes on a, you know, per employee basis. Cause some guys, let's say, um, let's say like Tyler mentioned, if someone listening to this in California as a journeyman has been doing it for years, never went union decides to come down to the Island and they're really good at what they do. They can go up to the union, uh, you know, whether it's a uh, finishing or, or carpenters union, go up there and then show them what they got and they could come in, uh, pretty much as a journeyman, you know, Mm -hmm. um, without having to do any of the schooling or anything. So it all depends on the, the worker, I think. What size is your crew, your crew right now? So we're fairly small. It's me. I'm, uh, uh, I'm in the office doing paperwork and whatnot, but majority of the time I'm on site, I'm helping them out, whether it's hanging or taping or whatnot. Uh, but it's me, two apprentices and another journeyman. So the four of us, and because it's so small, I'm able to keep pretty much everyone busy year round. You know, I don't want to bring in too much guys and then, you know, we'll take a a month off or, you know, or tell tell two guys, hey, you got to take a month off while the rest of us are working. I kind of try to manage it to to where everyone stays fairly busy throughout the year. How did, how did you establish that you said that you have a handful of contractors who are keeping you busy all the time? How did you develop those relationships? Um, honestly, the, the older ones, I used to work in the union, you know, the 40 hour week. And on the weekend, I would do, you know, side job for these contractors, you know, um, which is what pretty much everybody does down here on the island because the cost of living is so expensive sometimes your regular 40 doesn't cover it, you know? So you develop contacts of uh, GCs that are willing to, to pay you, you know, cash essentially to just do that, that work. So that's where it started. And then from that word of mouth, um, like this year alone, um, Instagram played a huge part. I met two contractors that uh, are into higher end builds that pretty much just uh, found us off of Instagram. So I think uh, nowadays, you know, everything is um, in social media plays a big part to a certain point. But for me, I got lucky. I met two GCs this year that do a lot of higher end homes that, you know, are repeat customers now. So why do you think that they're hiring you and coming back to you? I think, uh, well, I try to pride myself in the quality and also uh, integrity and honesty. So, uh, you know, a perfect example is that Lonnie Kai house that I talked to you about earlier that was um, that beachfront home. Um, I gave the GC a bid uh, before the electrical went in. And usually I like to do a walkthrough a little bit um, after, you know, a little bit before it's my turn, but after everyone else is done. So I can kind of gauge how long it's going to take us to do. This house, um, I think it had over 250 can lights. So he went kind of crazy with the, the lighting where, you know, each sheet required uh, two guys holding it and one guy routering it. Cause there was no way that you could router it with one hand. Cause it was, you know, it wasn't staying put. So it took a little longer to hang. And in turn, it took a little longer to finish. Cause not every, not every can light is going to be spot on, you know, you're going to have blowouts and whatnot. So because of that, I had to go a little bit higher and, you know, I explained it to him. I broke it down. And I mean, he was there daily looking at the progress and seeing what, you know, we weren't just messing around trying to, you know, just get extra money or whatnot. But uh, I think a lot of the times, especially if the budget's a little tight, you know, we all mess up. If you're willing to be honest and lay it out, um, you can come to an agreement. But uh, I'd like to think the main reason they use us is because of our quality and just how uh, friendly we are, our service, you know, we're, we're respectful. Uh, we get the job done fairly quick and the quality remains. Why? So what, uh, sorry, what, um, <clears throat> go ahead, Nick. Why not pursue the high end residential market versus <clears throat> union commercial? Um, I think, I, I mean, I, if I could get enough houses that were just high end throughout the year, then of course, you know what I mean? Do you think, but, do, do they exist or is there not? Is there not enough of them? Uh, I don't think there's enough of them, honestly, because if I were to just do high end throughout the year, 
I would have to acquire, I want to say about 40% of the GCs on island that do high end. Wow. You know what I mean? That's a big so number. That's, that's not realistic. You can't, you know, so uh, me having five GCs that use me repeatedly is already like a huge, mm -hmm. you know, it's a huge thing to be able to stay busy throughout the year. Um, so if there was a big enough market for that to happen, then of course, you know, I would just do a lot of high end homes and then I wouldn't have to deal with all the red tape that the, the commercial side has, you know, as far and as OSHA and all of that good stuff. Is, com is, is it becoming more commercialized? Cause I remember being in Maui and I forget where it was, but we got, it, it was right on the water and it was just, everything was new. It was like a brand new gap. Yeah. There's all like, the restaurants. were. There's involved. a yeah. lot. <laughs> yeah. I just remember pulling up. Like, Why yeah. is there a gap? Here? You went to Hawaii to go to gap. That's what I said. <laughs> we, we got down to the, the strip and it was just, it was all brand new. And I just remember seeing gap first and I was like, Where's Abercrombie? Where's Abercrombie? Yeah. Where's Abercrombie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, this is not what I can't. I remember fly, flying in and seeing Target. And it was in yeah. the middle. Like, there was nothing around. Just streets everywhere and a brand new Target. And they're like, oh, yeah. yeah, that opened up a week ago. Yeah, yeah. But is that... Yeah, is, so they are, are they are building a lot more high-rises. Here, Honolulu, I think, just from... You're looking at two years, at least seven high-rises have gone up. Uh, and that's affecting the local the local economy and everything. So there's a lot of people that aren't down for that, you know, because the housing is just going mm -hmm. higher and higher because of this. Um, the investors that are out of state, they come in and they build these high rises. So there's actual uh, laws and bills that have been passed that if you build a new high rise, a certain percentage have to be um, affordable manageable, uh, you know, wait, um, homes. So they have to be under a certain price. It can't be all multi-million dollar penthouses, you know, with view to the ocean mm -hmm. type of thing. So yeah, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of commercial, uh, going up, but the same thing, uh, like I said earlier is they're going up in record amount of time. So it sure. doesn't really mean that, oh, okay, we're going to have years worth of work. You know, it's not years, it's months now. But now put yourself in that position. If, if you're going to go into the commercial realm because it's more complicated, I, you know, not, let's not talk about Tiffany's. Let's talk about one of those high rises. You bid one of those jobs and then they're pushing you for speed. Can you produce at the quality that you want at the speed that they're going to force? Uh, no, if we were to go commercial, it'd have to be like a smaller kind of like, uh, Boutique if a subway, shows. yeah, boutiques, if subway is looking at a new location or, you know, gap. something much, yeah, gap, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Old Navy, something more along those lines, you know, more manageable, uh, something that size, uh, there's no way that that would have to be years True. of being in the union, knowing the ins and outs and building the right capita and connections to be able to, to, you know, handle something like that. So you talked well, about foreign investors because that's something that, you know, I remember being in Detroit and there there's a lot of that and they're mandating it. And, you know, as these well, cities get Vancouver developed. Vancouver too. Yeah, and they're they're starting to Huge mandate, problem in Vancouver. You know, like I know in um I think it's in Detroit there's a neighborhood that you have to live there in order to All even of it. buy it. You can't buy unless you live there. Right. Yeah. So you can't go in there and make a profit. But I know, like, who was it? Um, Dakota Homes yep. was telling us that up there, they everyone was all foreign investors, and then they'd all buy and build, and then no one was living in these places. So the infrastructure was dying because no one was going to the restaurants, buying yeah. anything. So then they, they changed the taxes and how everything worked, and then <laughs> no one develops there anymore. So it's like this whole market swing and then just died off. So, I mean, it happens here, too. In yeah. I guess what I was getting at with that question is, you know, like Tyler used the example, the guy in L.A. or someone over in, you know, and this part flies out to Hawaii, wants to be, you know, wants to start a company, wants to start a drywall company. I mean, is that you said that, the, you know, there's a lot of locals that aren't down for the building and the, the increased high rises. Is that a similar mentality across like? someone going someone relocating from you know la or the, you know and out out to hawaii and to, uh, to start, you know to kind of break into that market oh Not yeah as a, totally. as a developer but as a you know say as a builder 
Yeah, so let's say you're a GC and you're trying to relocate to Oahu mm-hmm. and you know you're trying to establish it's hard. It's hard because um I feel because like the of roots that, are because deep. of the you know, they, they kind of try to protect, you know what I mean? So you, Dude, you it'd kinda be hard want... for us to go yeah. in a couple of towns <laughs> a couple of towns away. Yeah. It's like me going to New Jersey. I wouldn't know what the heck to do. Yeah, I think I think anywhere, True. honestly, because you know I if you're a lot. If you're coming from somewhere else, yeah. And you're trying to set up shop in someone else's territory, you know, quote unquote, it's, you're going to, you're going to face some adversity, but, uh, I think if you provide a quality product, you know, no matter where you go, I'm just planning my relocation. I'm more thinking how many high rises can they put in this Island? Right. Like I, yeah. in my yeah. head, I have like this. No, yeah, island. there is, there is a cap, you know, right. They're gonna Thankfully, run out of room. We haven't hit that. I mean, look at Vegas, Vegas, they just kept building, building, building. And then, a uh, little bit after that uh, that recession, it was just um, everything. You know, froze. a dead zone. Everything was just yeah, uh, exactly. there was no building going on. So there was a lot of during that time we had a boom with the high rises. So a lot of Vegas uh, workers came down to the island and worked on these high rises that I'm talking about. Interesting. Yeah, I was curious what's what's your labor pool like on a smaller scale, not necessarily for the union, but like, who are you hiring? What was that question to me or, 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 Oh yeah. You, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like on a, on a, on a smaller scale, not, it would be, it could be directed to you, but also if it were a general contractor, somebody doing residential down there, what's the labor pool look like? Is it just the kids get done? Do they go to college? Um, or is it mostly local people Are people coming in from California to work in your market since, like where, no, where are you I think pulling res- from? Yeah, so residential, the thing that happens here um, that ties in directly to the cost of living is um, if, you're a G- if you're a GC or any type of subcontractor um, and let's say you have a big house, what a lot of guys do is they'll pull from their buddies that are in the union that are laid off. So, you know, if they've been laid off and they can't collect unemployment or whatever, you'll bring them on board for a couple months to finish that project. And then they'll, when they get called back to the union, you'll let them go back to the union. You know what I mean? So, um, they kind of just, you pull from the union uh, members. And if not, then you pull from the other guys that are on the residential side that, that aren't working. So, uh, for me, uh, I'm pretty blessed. Uh, I have at least, I want to say 15 family members that are tradesmen. You know, ranging from GCs to carpenters to the plastermen. So if we ever need an extra hand, I can just bring, you know, a cousin or somebody that that I've known since I was little on board, you know, for the extra hand to help. Uh, what, but majority of the jobs that we do are just pretty much the set guys that I have. So what are um, as far as the the local kids and the youth? What are they doing once they're getting done with school? Is everyone getting up and going off to college, or a lot of people working in family businesses, or people getting involved with the trades? Surfing. Uh, I think I think it it kind of ties into you know like for me for example my dad was a drywaller right so what I did was I actually went to college I got my associates I was I was looking into architecture but I was doing drywall on the side. So what made me just jump into drywall completely was um, at the point, the time, the time, um, the pay that I was getting, you know, I looked at it, I sat down and I looked at the colleges that I had to pay for myself. Uh, They were charging, you know, uh, thousands of dollars for a semester as opposed to I was already making $30 an hour at that time, you know? So it was an easy, it was an easy choice for me um, to not, continue setting and uh, you know but uh for some kids um uh, like for example the the guys that i have um uh, pretty much their parents their dads were were drywallers so they became drywallers um a lot of the guys that i know in the union you know it was their family um that brought them in you know you made them union uh but here I think it's a little bit of both, just like anywhere, you know, th- there are a lot of kids going to college. Some of them go to college and come back with a lot of student loan and then, you know, student debt and then end up joining the the union to try to pay that off. And you know what I mean? So 
it kind of a little bit of everything I want to say, you know, as far as uh, the youth after after high school, some of them uh, some of them join the union right away or or go and you know steady for a little bit. Maybe it doesn't work out. They come back, then join the union. So I feel like most places where it's either a destination or a vacation place, there's most of the local people. It seems like the economy depends on the people coming and visiting and it needs that boost from them. But it's also that same business that kind of keeps them where they are because it right it raises the cost of living and it raises the house price yeah. and everything else and it almost like you guys depend on your area being a destination you repent you depend on tourism you depend on that economy but at the same time that drives the cost of your living so far up that it's like you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't yeah exactly so our main <laughs> contributor to our economy down here in the islands is the military so that's the number one number two is tourism so yeah, just exactly like what you said, you know, that we have to find that sweet middle spot. Uh, but in all honesty, you know, everyone that comes and visits here, you know, they'll come down here and you know, it, it is paradise, you know, beautiful weather. Uh, there's a little bit of traffic, a lot of other stuff going on, but um, a lot of people that vacation want to kind of make it their home, you know, and uh, it just, it is what it is. And, I hope that we don't we don't we don't ever get to a point where it turns into kind of like how Vegas was where you can't build anymore and then if we hit anything like that then uh you know something's going to happen you know cuz a lot of there is a lot of tradesmen that uh depend directly on tourism and foreign investors and high rises and buildings going up you know well, you said that when the the recession hit, a lot of the people left Vegas to come and work in Hawaii. Were you guys not affected the same way? No. Yeah. So here, the, so if you're, and I think that's why we do get a lot of foreign investors is because the market here is pretty stable. Like it just keeps going up. You know, so, so I'm, if you look I'm at your way. The, yeah. <laughs> It just keeps going up, you know, uh, um, especially here on Oahu, you know. Uh, the outer islands are a little bit different. Like if you go to the big island, the housing is a lot cheaper down there because there's no um, plumbing, you know, there's no electrical. So you would have to put your own. In a lot of locations, you'll buy an acre of land, but you got to figure all that stuff out, you know. As what far do you mean the there's no plumbing goes. and electrical? Uh, it won't tie in directly, you know, like the, here no in Oahu. Grid? Um, there's no grid to attach to. Yeah. So you'd have to do like a, uh, depending on the location, you know, because the big island is so big, there's a lot of beautiful remote locations where you would kind of have to, in a sense, figure it out, you know, uh, how to tie into the electrical. So if you build in a remote location, what they'll do is they'll put water catchers. They'll, you know, they'll do like a cesspool the cesspool underneath the house. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as far as electrical goals, they'll just do a lot of solar panels. There's a grid on the island, but you're saying that there's just a lot of remote locations on that island. Exactly. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. All right. So That's where I want to go. What's that? That's where I want to go. <laughs> Get me away from everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there you could buy, you know, you could buy a big lot and, you know, uh, full-on country island living. Here in Oahu, it's a little bit more harder to, you know, if you don't, if you're a regular working person, you know, it's harder to be able to afford a lot that size to, mm -hmm. to have that type of living down here, at least, because everything, the land is so expensive. What about the other islands? Um, Kauai, I've been to, it's super relaxed. When I went down there, I think the biggest thing they had at the time was a Walmart. Um, and Kauai, there's no freeways. There's one main road going in and one main road going out. So if there's like a really bad accident or whatever, you're pretty much stuck. Got in my head, I'm ignorant and be like, I can't believe they have cars. I feel like it'd be, <laughs> like, it'd be like scooters or bikes and you just bike, because you're talking islands, like, right? Yeah. I mean, they're yeah. big islands. I know, I, I, I don't yeah. know. Like, it's like the vineyard, they still have cars, but <laughs> right. a lot of people bike the vineyard right. because True. it's that much easier and it's kind of that slow and easy pace. 
And then it's and then Maui, right? Yeah, then Maui. Maui's a little bit like Oahu in a sense. Sure. Where you know it's busy. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff going on. But uh, the busiest island, if you go to all of them, you know, it's it's Oahu. There's more stuff going on, more building. Um, Here's more where I failed life. geography. Is there only four? No, I think there's there's eight, and then Las Vegas is considered the ninth island, just because everybody that's retired what? down here goes and huh? vacations down there. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't need to even learn geography. You have gambling's Google now. not gambling's not allowed I down here, ask. so everybody goes to Vegas to gamble. Oh, really? Yeah. Wait, so. You out, you guys. They'll don't... be putting a they'll be putting a casino up before you know. So there's a ton of flights from Vegas to Hawaii. Yeah, there's this thing called Vacations Hawaii that is just a airline specifically to fly to Vegas back and forth. And you stay at the California hotel, and so it's like a package deal. What's the what's the rate on that? We could come after IBS. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler, I don't know. It. I've never. I, think, like I always fly yeah. Hawaiian when I go down there. Um, you guys also don't have wildlife, right? Oh no, there is. Yeah, in the no, mountains, there's, there's a... there, I know I'm not making this up. There, like, is <laughs> Dude, it snakes Joe... or reptiles or something? Like, you guys don't have. No, we don't have snakes. Yeah, there's no. Unless there's like you certain bring them illegally, and then that's expect. like a huge wildlife fine. is wildlife is is definitely. But like, yeah, like... wildlife and snakes are two different. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know Joe yeah, Rogan so talks can about go on a hike. hunting. You Someone can go on a hike on... without having to worry about. You know, getting bit by a poisonous snake or a uh, spider or anything like that. But, like, what about deer? Yeah, Rogan goes down yeah. and hunts. Yeah, there, there's... But didn't there's, someone uh, bring them there? Oh, oh. There's boar. But, is it, like, weren't, oh. they, weren't they brought there? This is why everyone's listening right now, is for this exact <laughs> minute. Yeah. One hour, <laughs> one minute in. Nick's finally getting comfortable enough to ask the questions that have been on his mind all day from reading Snapple facts. <laughs> That's so awesome. I, I don't think I'm making that up. Someone's gonna someone's gonna rip me one. Uh, feel, which is fine. No, it's if I said it. <laughs> Did anyone hear Johnny ask if there was deer on Hawaii? <laughs> um now I forget where I was going with that. Do you guys hunt? Yeah, so there's a lot of guys. I've gone hunting once, but uh, here the main thing to hunt is wild boar. Is fish. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can go spear fishing. Yeah, there's a lot of guys that go uh, spear fishing, free diving. Wild boar. Those things are scary. Oh yeah, they're 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 crazy. So you you take the hunting dogs up there, and then <clears throat> they they kind of injure it a little bit, and then you go in for the kill. So um. What's it, do you, I feel like, I know a couple of people who live in vacation areas who live in like a tourist area. Is it all year round for you guys? Do you have a specific season? Is there a time where it's like, I don't even want to go out to work because I'm dealing with traffic and tourists and all of this crap? No, traffic is pretty horrible year round down here. Like it, it's to the point where they're building this thing called the rail. And um, if you visited Honolulu, uh, you know, a while back before they built this and then you come back, you're going to, you're going to be like, what the heck's up with all these pillars in the middle of the, you know, the medium lane. But yeah, it's just uh, the, I don't know who planned it or what type of budgeting went into play, but they went over budget within the first year. Um, they're not even halfway done. Uh, I, I tell everybody they're going to finish when my one-year-old graduates high school. It's Pretty like much crazy. Sounds like every job that I've ever had. <laughs> well, it's like the big dig. Everyone calls it a failure, but then like a million people moved here after they finished it. Like, yeah. it, it never had a chance. Yeah, so it's it's one of those things that once it's done, we'll really be able to see if it if it's actually going to help lighten the load. But it stretches from the west side of the island, and uh, hopefully they finish it all the way to Waikiki, which is what they initially thought. But the cost has just gone up so high that. Uh, they're kind of just playing it by ear, see how, how much they can they can build. Uh, but, yeah, that hopefully is going to alleviate a lot of the traffic uh, for the people that work in town. You know, their regular 9 to 5 in the high rises and whatnot, they could catch the rail uh, to work and back, ideally. But for someone like, like me, you know, I need to carry material. I, I need to, you know, I need a truck to be able to go from job to job. So that's more, I think, geared 
towards uh, office workers or someone that has a fixed location, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, hopefully that alleviates it. But for me, coming from town to Pro City, which is kind of like in the middle, it takes about an hour worth of traffic, which would normally take, I want to say, 15 minutes without traffic. Um, the, the speed down here is 55 miles an hour. So it is a lot slower than, you know, the mainland where, you know, in some areas, 80 is pretty slow, you know, if you're driving. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Speed but yeah, I me. mean. It's usually the, set, the lights. When the lights don't yeah. turn, <laughs> that's when it makes me go crazy. Yeah. Like, I don't care about speed. It's just like if this light takes a minute, <laughs> it feels yeah. like eternity. So you kind of get used to it, honestly, you know. You already know you're going to hit an hour worth of traffic, so you kind of just buckle in and. Just tough it out. That's why you buy Tesla, right? So it just drives yeah. itself. <laughs> Tesla are there a lot of Tesla trucks. out there? Yeah, there is. There's the, um, there's a lot of incentives for for uh, people that are trying to go green. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So even with like the solar paneling, yeah, so there was a nuts, huge right? boom. Yeah. When they first came out, there was like a huge tax deductible and all of that. I think they just, I, I think we're coming up on the last year that they offered like, I think, a certain percentage off, but at one point, I think it got to like 50% off your paneling. So wow. if you spent 20 grand to, to make your um, your home, you know, solar paneling a uh, little bit more green, then they would they would return half of that. So it it essentially only be 10 grand for you know, and then the electrical bill, which normally would have been let's say 400 bucks, turns into you know 50 dollars. You know, so yeah. So there wanna... was a huge push for that. Yeah. Go ahead, Nick. I uh, what is so on like a daily basis? What is um, what's your job look like? As far as like, what do you think is different with where you're located? What you do being a drywaller than if you were in California? Like, what challenges do you face, or you know, the cost of the materials obviously is more and it's probably getting materials there and everything else. But what challenges do you think you face being where you are on a daily basis versus being somewhere like California? Um, I think it's pretty similar because California, uh, maybe there's not traffic, but everything's just way farther, you know? So if you get a job, um, down in, I, when I was there working with my uncle, who's a GC, he lives in West Covina area, uh, and he had a job in Palm Springs. So that ended up being like an hour, close to a two-hour drive going at 80 miles an hour, you yeah. know? Wow. So so it's just different. Here, it's not that far, but you're sitting in traffic. Over there, it's far, but there's no traffic. So it kind of just, um, you know, it's just a different beast that you have to just – as far as driving, but material, you know, it's a little bit more expensive, but the pay is a little better. But if you're looking at the union wage in California to the union wage here, it's only about a, maybe a five, $6 difference. Uh, but if you're looking at the homes and the pricing, you know, yeah. it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. So uh, I think that's the main thing that we face is, you know, the budget on some of these houses that, you know, I got a PDF the other day. It's an ADU. Oh, what an ADU is here, it's an additional dwelling unit. They're becoming more and more popular. The state is allowing you to build on your property uh, up to a certain square footage, a detached home. A lot of people are using it to rent to help offset the mortgage of the property that they just bought or whatnot. Yeah, they're doing that a lot on the West Coast too. Yeah. yeah. So, so that I got the, the PDF, I think it was about a hundred sheets. Um, they said the budget, the budget for that hanging, taping finish was 3000. I, I, I didn't $3, even, I thought that was a $3,000. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I replied, I was like, are you sure you got the numbers right? Cause it was a new estimator that the, the GC was trying out and she said, yeah, but if you know, if you need a little bit more, let me know. What, you know, I, what should I brought it been? in. I, I brought it in. It's a cookie cutter ADU. I brought it in at 65. So more than twice. You know what I mean? So. Um, yeah, I feel like that's like a kitchen. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah I, I just exactly. I just did like a basically I don't know six by ten bathroom or something like that, and it was like two grand. So granted, it's a small job, so you're still yeah. paying for that, but like three three thousand dollars for a hundred sheets. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. even pick up a hundred sheets. <laughs> load them for three yeah, grand yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so thankfully it was just a pdf but i mean you know uh, getting offers like that is kind of like really guys you know we're we're here in hawaii i live in hawaii too you know <laughs> well everything is going back to your goal your end goal of you know becoming union right what you know you've been in business for three years now what are the, you know, I already asked what the next steps were, but what, like, when, it, when does that transition happen? Are you actively looking for, you know, a gap to hang board in and consider bidding against the union or, you know, the Tiffany's job, I assume, I think you said you did that when you were in the union. Yes. You know, what, when does that start happening? When do you start going after those jobs or are you going to unionize beforehand? I guess that's uh, what I'm really asking is when, like, when do you start putting your toes in the water and, and running the risk of, you know, making the union like mad network, networking and, and reaching out? Yeah. Yeah. So what I, I mean, my main goal, you know, we're, this is starting our third year. My main goal, the first year, year and a half was to brand myself and kind of just uh, kind of branch out a little bit. You know, we went from three contractors that use us throughout the year to five, you know, uh, we've also been blessed uh, through Instagram. We we became a product partner of Marshalltown. That was pretty big. Um, Marshalltown, they're they're uh, they're based out of Iowa. They do a lot of um, cement uh, tools, drywall tools. So uh, I think we've been we've been pretty good at that. Pretty blessed uh, with being able to make the right connections. I think our next step, moving next year, is to do that because uh, this year alone, I I personally turned down three fairly big commercial jobs because I felt like, you know, this is, this is an awesome opportunity, but I don't feel, um, I, I don't think we're there yet, you know, as a company, um, just individually, I don't think I'd be able to handle to keep the five GCs that use us happy and be able to undertake a fairly big, uh, one of them was like a big warehouse, uh, they were building from the ground up. Um, you know, I, I, I let it go cause I wasn't going to be able to, but to come on, that. man, you can make so much yeah. money. <laughs> like that's what every guy that thinks about volume is thinking right now when he listens to this is like, but the money's there. You yeah, know what? Make yeah. three guys unhappy, but make some cake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I think eventually, you know, it just has to feel right. And, uh, that along with the capita, I need to build the capita a little more to be able to undertake jobs like that. Sure. Where if the GC's late on a payment or he's not getting paid, they're tie up on, you know, whatever, I can still keep everything afloat. And it's not like, oh, we had everything writing on this one big yeah. payout. You know what I mean? What What's your payment structure now? Are you, is it half up front, half when you're done? I mean, it's a seven day. A lot of these uh, projects are well, like the, seven days. The good thing about the half of the guys that you that that use me, I've known them. You know, my oldest GC, I've known him for over ten years. So with them, I don't really ask for anything up front. I who, just who pays the material? Do they? Uh, they'll pay the material. There you go. Yeah. So they'll do the material. I'll finish the house, and then I tried to get them on a ten day payment schedule, but uh, right now we're at a month. So. <laughs> You know, <laughs> you try, you know, old habits die hard, you know, um, now that, you know, everything's legit and all of that, uh, trying to get them on a 10 day payment schedule, you know, so I can keep payroll going and everything, everything, uh, solid, but, uh, well, it, it the, the a... newer ones, the newer ones, I will collect a certain percentage up front for material. Mm -hmm. And then if the job's big enough, I'll do a progress payment. Sure. And then we won't do the final payment till we do the walkthrough with the homeowner or the, the GC. Um, they'll call us out on anything. Uh, we'll fix it. And then, you know, uh, majority of the times we don't really get any callbacks uh, until uh, they live in it for a while. Maybe there was some shifting going on or whatnot. You know, there's a little hairline fracture here and there. You know, we'll fix that. But 
other than that, I've been pretty fortunate with the, the guys that, that use me as far as payment and collecting and all that goes. So four guys, how many jobs a year do you do? Uh, this year has been, a, I think, uh, homes, brand new homes. We did a little bit over 30 this year. Uh, but we'll do a lot of remodels like this last, I want to say these last two months have been remodel after remodel. Uh, just because everybody starts to tighten their belt as far as new builds go, but um, towards you know the the holidays, they don't want to you know they don't want to go into the Christmas and Thanksgiving worrying about the house being built and whatnot. But um, yeah, for the the last all of December, I think I got from right now I got about three three brand new homes. So we're gonna finish pr fairly strong. We got three brand new homes being built. Uh, the one I just did a material takeoff on Saturday, that one's going to be close to 300 sheets. It's a cookie cutter home, two story. But, um, for your business, uh, we always like to kind of discuss what the point of, or like entering into your market is like, um, in New Jersey, you basically pay a fee with the division of consumer affairs and you get, um, what for lack of a better term a license but it's really not a license um and you're allowed to do work as a home improvement contractor but there's no tests you don't have to do anything else so you can literally go start an llc nobody's gauging how much work you've done what your qualifications are pick up insurance and have a company what's it what was it like to get your company up and running in hawaii Oh yeah, so here I, I think they're pretty strict compared to other areas. You need to pass uh, a business law exam uh, along with whatever specific, you know, let's say you're going in for an electrical trade, you have to pass a written exam on top of the business and law. They want to make sure that you know the laws that you have to abide by as far as payroll, you know, uh, the unemployment, all of that good stuff goes. and depending on what um, you're getting certified as or you're going into a license and there's a separate test. So like, if you're going to do a general contractor's test, um, there's three different exams that you have to pass in order to go along. Before you even get to that, it takes about six months worth of verifying and paperwork where you have to show them that you have at least four years of uh, supervision experience as far as dealing with uh, payroll or, you know, bidding a job, hours, all of that good stuff. So there's a little bit more um, things you have to do than just going in and registering. A lot of guys go and just register uh, to pay their GE taxes, right? And then they'll, they'll register kind of like as a handyman, uh, but they have to stay under a thousand dollars as far as the scope of work goes. So if they're doing, thousand uh, dollars and under uh, then you know all of that is legal so each of their job has to be less than a thousand dollars less that's than a thousand dollars yeah for us what's that that's hic for us yeah, yeah anything over a thousand or uh, i guess it's uh, anything over a thousand requires the hic contract yeah so you pay into it right we're getting over one everyone's head going right over everyone's head hic home improvement contractor <laughs> in mass but for us, we have the CSL, which is construction supervisor license, and that's yeah, we required. Don't have that. That's a test, a painful test. <laughs> it's memorization of a book. That it is. Yeah. Now there's eight books, and they all contradict each other, different tabs in different areas. So you have to understand the predecessors of the decision making. Whatever. Do you <laughs> I'm teaching that class next week. Your teacher? Are you? No, I'm not. I was no, like, I'm wait, what? <laughs> I'll never forget. Like, one of the questions was, if Susie opens a hair salon in her basement and has four steps leading up to her front door with no handicap parking, is she required to have a handrail on the handicap ramp? And I was like, yes. I, I have no idea where to get that answer. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it sounds like like the. Yeah. It was just yeah, it sounds every like you question. Have to, you had to find like what the contradictions are of the code. Yeah. Whatever. Sorry, that was good. That was a good talk. Good piece. Yeah. <laughs> People are going to love that part. <laughs> <laughs> Killing it. I, uh, it. It's just funny to me that it's, we always talk that it's so different from state to state. Um, how 
what's required in mass can be different than what's required in Hawaii than what's required in New Jersey. And I'm one who's, there's some states that we've spoken to people that are super difficult, like uh, Andy Moore said that they were making it very difficult down in Virginia to become a contractor. Um, there's another, Nate uh, Searborn was saying that it, it's basically weeding out a lot of the people who aren't legitimate, who aren't running their business in a legitimate way, which for everyone who is going through the correct steps and legitimizing their business and paying the proper insurances and licensing and testing and paying their employees the right amount and workers comp and all that stuff. It kind of helps them out because all these people who are undercutting them, it's getting rid of them. And now like the price point of the market goes up and it's, you don't have people coming in where it's like, well, I can do that job for half of that price. Oh yeah, I totally. Like. Yep. I kind of wish New Jersey would adopt a little bit more. I think that the point of entry for our market is too easy that you can just basically go out with no experience and start a company and then go work in somebody's house without really knowing what you're doing. And there's nobody to stop you or prevent you from doing that or protect homeowners from hiring somebody who's doing that. Yeah, no, they, they make it uh, fairly difficult. Uh, in all honesty, the first time they rejected me, even though I had, you know, over 15 years of experience. Um, so I had to go in, I sat down with the, the person in charge of, uh, you know, um, filtering all the weeding out all the, the bad eggs and whatnot. I talked to her, I explained everything and I pretty much just filled out the paperwork the wrong way. Uh, they, they really want you to document where you were, what you did, how big the project was, how the payroll went, how much hours, you know, all of that. So once I did that, um, that got accepted. And then the testing, the business in law, like, like you guys mentioned, it is pretty much just memorizing you know, half the stuff you memorize um, is stuff you're going to actually remember. And then the other half, you're just eventually going to forget, you know, and it's just. Which is, um, which is crazy because I don't think there's any testing for drywall guys for us. No. It stops. I mean, when they switch to the sheet metal permit, that, that threw a wrench into everyone's thing where now you can't run like before our, what was it? Certain guys would like, we'd run our own duct work for the, mm -hmm. the dryer and stuff like that. Now it has to be a certain guy, pulls a permit, all this stuff, and that threw a wrench into everyone's plans, what, five years ago? Are they inspecting Oh, you need separately? a separate yeah. permit to be running the duct work, like mechanical? Mechanical, but but also like, hey, your dryer vent. Like the dryer vent's kind of this gray area, like who's responsible for it? Yeah. Right. Same as like a hood, you know, and who's doing the makeup air. It was your always- bathroom a, exhaust vent. Exactly, like how much of it's hard duct, you know, a percentage of it. But more importantly, like the length of that dryer run because it's fires and it can't be flexed and it can't be screwed, all these things and what the linear footage, are you adding uh, you know, a blower for that? that? That changed the game so you have to have all that in. And sometimes we would have our HAC guy do it. Sometimes it would be somebody else. Sometimes it would be me. Mm -hmm. And now that, we have to, that inspection happens, we get electrical plumbing and then our HVAC, which is sheet metal, inspects that. So that yeah, was another good talk. Nobody inspects our duct work. Yeah. I mean, but... it's just, it, it's plumbing, electrical, building, but like I've never had anyone come through and like actually check any of that stuff. But then it goes to like, I think Nick in the city, correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't had it yet, but there's like, was it Somerville? They do a screw, uh, screw inspection. inspection. Yeah. Which really? Does, yeah. So it's, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> yeah. We did a, that small kitchen. We had like, eight boards up he's like don't forget about your screw inspection cuckoo oh. right i was like <laughs> that's crazy i was like okay yeah, we don't have that yeah. so it, it, like he screws. came in for the rough and at the end of the day i called him back i'm like can can you come back tomorrow yeah <laughs> dude i'd have my guys just nail it up like old school no screws this guy yeah. is shocked someone posted on instagram recently a drywall guy was like going for a nail inspection today and i i couldn't tell him <laughs> the in his story i'm like did he nail that the old school hatchet yeah, that's badass. There's that viral yeah. video of the guy. Using oh yeah, hatchet. yeah, yeah. That's pretty crazy, man. I'm watching that, him do that the viral curves. Video. And it's like this guy's making it look easy. Yeah, he's look at those boards. He's not though. even dirty. Look at those boards. They're two foot in width. Yeah, they're like yeah. two by four. Yeah. yeah, that's how my first uh, my house in Norton was. It was all two. It's by funny, four no ball. videos of those guys putting up lath, like hammering up lath. I don't see that video. I'd love to. Yeah. <laughs> 
cameras didn't exist back then. Yeah, I mean, or, a lot of towns are starting to adopt it. Do, doesn't Wellesley? No. They don't do a screw inspection? No. No. I've heard of it around here, but I've never had anyone actually inspect for it's it. It's more of a commercial thing. It commercially do a screw inspection. That's why Somerville, I think, adopted it. Well, until you get into, like, the high-rise, they don't even do inspections. It's all affidavits. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. They just came... We did that. I did that one high rise project, and they come out randomly. I'm like, so what's going on? I'm like, building a high rise. He's like, yeah, I'm gonna walk around for a little bit, but I don't need to do anything. It's, it's, an it's like when I did the big dig. Remember that big dig? Yeah. It's like every inspector had no idea. We're 35 feet in the ground. They were just coming by just to go like make sure there's a stamp on the. What building. is going on over right. here? They had no idea what to inspect. I remember we got like a bottom of hole inspection. They were like, what is that? That's a soil nail wall. <laughs> <laughs> we have an engineer don't worry it's like yeah bottom of hole looks good guys <laughs> keep, keep it going 35 hey, Guillermo, foot straight are wall. you guys getting into a lot of the new products that i mean i guess they're not that new anymore but products on the market rather than you know metal corner beads and all that stuff i feel like the drywall industry the past few years um has been putting out for you know what would be for you some pretty neat products yeah i mean here in oahu pretty much all the corner bead is vinyl because of the high humidity and salt water in the air. Mm. If you put up metal bead, um, it's going to rust. It's going to rust and it's, it's going to been pop. that way for a long time. No, it just started. I want to say, um, within the last maybe 10, no, a little bit more, maybe in the last 15, 20 years, every, all the new construction has been, uh, vinyl. Uh, some guys, you'll get some old timers that are used to the metal that will do it. But, um, honestly, if it's not in the specs, then, you know, they can get away with it. But for all the commercial, all the commercial projects, it's in the specs. They specify that they want the vinyl because sure. it's way more, uh, resilient down here. Majority of the vinyl is all trim Tex, which is a specific brand. But, um, have you gotten into any of their custom stuff that you can do with that? Um, yeah, so the, uh, they'll, they'll be like, uh, for the commercial side, sometimes we'll do, um, um, we'll do offices or, you know, uh, renovation type of thing where the grid is already in, uh, they have this cool, uh, angle grid. That's kind of like a wall angle and an L trim put together. So what you'll do is you'll hang the board and then you put up that piece of trim on top and no matter where you built the wall whether it was in the middle of a square or not uh it gives the the ceiling grid a finished look because it it creates oh, like yeah. a nice wall angle at the edge rather than a just you know straight up uh factory cut piece of drywall up on top yeah up against it yeah up against the ceiling grid because nick you use a lot of the like the tearaway and stuff like that for a lot of your stuff right uh yeah we we use a tear tear away yeah, yeah. like the, the L trim but we still that. use and metal corner bead yeah oh um, okay. we use tear away for when we go to like reclaim wood when it's butting up against yeah. it yeah 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 or if exactly. we do like plaster returns against a window mm -hmm. um but like the regular details we've switched to aluminum on that just yeah because it's straighter but to, yeah it's it yeah the metal is way easier to install because it stays it's stiff you know but um. The trim techs, I think, at least here, longevity-wise, it just, uh, it'll rust out. So even like, especially when we do EFIS exterior, the staples, we use uh, stainless steel. Because if you use just regular staples, yeah, they'll start course. to pop. Sure. And, you know. Um, I so, use stainless for everything, putting up plastic. I'm just high quality. Do your guys, do your guys nail on corner Johnny beads? Johnny uses stainless spread? for everything. Uh, He's just stainless nail. framing nails, guys. <laughs> John and Nick, do your guys nail on corner beat or screw it? It's uh, stapled. Yeah, stapled. Because it gets plastered. It's a full veneer plaster. So oh, okay. Yeah. Where we are, it's everything's blue board and plaster. We don't do any drywall. Oh, okay. Which I, I feel like they, I throw a couple, why, they might throw but... a couple nails in and to start it, and then they level it, and then they nails. staple the crap out of it. Never seen that. And then what, tape be... over it? No. No. They it's scratch. Mesh. They scratch coat first. The scratch out, yeah. Yeah, it's got like a wire, uh, like a wire mesh to it. Oh, okay. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah here I... no, the inside is drywall, and then only um, 
when we do the e face here it's 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 more d face it's directly applied so we'll we'll directly apply the dense glass to the waterproof membrane yeah. on the outside yeah and then we'll mesh and give it a base coat and then uh let that base coat dry give it a nice tight second base coat to work out all the lap marks and whatnot and then put a finish a finish hand float on top of that Wait, to tyler's point you know about new products and things like that do you guys you know are you seeing stuff in the mainland that we're using whether it's different types of board different you know different products different compounds anything that you guys don't have your hands on or can't get your hands on i i would expect yes because of the high price point you're paying already for a regular sheet yeah so here there's not too much var variety a lot of the stuff is special order so there's some stuff like uh to speak the more the more popular stuff that you'll see online is uh this thing called butt board yep. where you'll put at the end of a factory sheet and it'll it'll make it kind of dip in a little bit mm -hmm. and create kind of like a nice factory uh, and then you don't so, have to land on a uh, you don't have to land on the joist or a stud too. Yeah, yeah. Which I'm that still suspect That is super of. expensive. I went to the main um, product, um, J and B material down here on the island that that I use. Um, I think uh, it, it ended up being like almost uh, eight dollars a piece. It was it was kind of like it didn't make sense to use. You know sure. what I mean? Right. Because you're not going to waste eight dollars worth of mud to actually split up a butt joint like you normally would uh, if you're doing it the regular way. Um, but yeah, some stuff I have tried, like, uh, I don't know if you guys heard of fiber fuse. It's kind of like yeah. a paper tape alternative. It was super popular online. Um, I honestly didn't like it too much because I did a big house with it. And, and you um, just itched from insulation from the fiber Yeah, glass. so it's itchy. It's super it's itchy. terrible. Yeah, it's super itchy, but on top of that, it kind of, if there's any type of movement or settling going on, um, it tends to crack way easier than paper tape would uh, because it's so thin, you know? They came up with an upgraded version of it that has kind of like mesh tape on the other side of it. Uh, that is probably going to hold up way better, but um, yeah, I, I would only use it for patches if you're trying to blend in. Um, you know, like a perfect uh, use for that would be um, before I left the union full time, we were doing a remodel in a hotel where they prefab the soffits. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Um, they'll miter the drywall oh, at yeah. the factory yep. and it's already pre-bent. So then you don't have to corner beat it. It's mm -hmm. already kind of finished. Um, and you would only have to finish where the, the two pieces meet if it's a long run. Uh, and that, in that instance, fiber fuse is perfect because it's nice and thin, so you won't you won't create like a hump where the two soffits kind of meet, you know, where you have to tape that joint. It's uh, less of a hump than a paper tape, so it blends in a little easier. But um, whenever I have the opportunity, I'll special order certain projects if it's you know reasonable, and I'll try it out just to try to see you know anything that can provide a quality finish and save us a little bit of time. Uh, I'm all for it. I'm surprised you're not doing anything that, like, I always debate on doing my basements with something that's more of a dense board where it doesn't have a paper face. Yeah. Um, with all the moisture you guys have there, is, is that a viable option or? Yeah, you guys using moisture resistant board. Yeah. Yeah, we do, but there's no basements down here. Yeah, but at, uh, your yeah. upstairs is as wet as my basement is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll use the moisture board in, like, wet areas where there's a, uh, you know, in the bathrooms, in the kitchens, where the pipes are. But other than that, it's pretty much just regular. But you guys aren't also aren't using vapor barrier in your no. insulation or anything no. like that. No. So I'm sure everything's breathing a lot more too, John. True. true. I just figured, I, I debate it all the time. Like you see some shows or where they're doing it in bathrooms and they do it in basements. And I, I have debated it a lot where it has something a little bit more resilient down there. I just yeah. and then you get a little pushback on the plasters because it doesn't. It's a lot more work you to get, get the door here. It, yeah, yeah. It's blue board. So I mean, is I don't know. I, from a drywall guy, I wanted to hear what you know what the options are. Um, yeah, I mean they have uh, they have what I've done. Like the current house we're doing, it's up in um, Manoa, a beautiful home. It's super custom. One of the more intricate builds that we're doing this year. Uh, but that 
homeowner decided to pretty much tile majority of the walls and uh, they're doing like a nice whitewash uh, herringbone ceiling with the wood, the redwood. It's just, they're, they're not worried about the money, you know, they're making everything nice. Uh, but yeah, in some areas, the, the tile and the draw are going to meet. So it's just easier to hang a type of dense glass, uh, that the towel can go over. And then all we'd have to do is just skim over it as yeah, like far den, as den you know, shield somebody, you can use like for a, that. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's fiberglass too, though. You're probably, that's probably why you left early today. So yeah. you're not itching. <laughs> He's like, all right, guys, just install this den shield. We'll be good to go. I'll catch you here yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Let me know no, when you're we're, done. We're finishing up the garage doing, uh, tying in the, the old with the new, uh, hanging five eights. Uh, they got it. There was only like maybe six sheets left of like patching in to do. What were you going to say, John? Nothing. The dense glass, you're just taping that normal, or do you have to do a full skim on that? Uh, yeah, you'd have to. Uh, um, that that particular home is going to be level five, so we just skim the whole thing. Probably so give level, it two nice coats. Is level five when I've seen guys they basically mix mud super wet and roll it on like paint? Exactly. That's yeah. a level five. That's, That's a level five. So what a level five is, you'll three coat the joints three times. Mm -hmm. You'll hand sand it to a finish and then you roll every square inch of drywall with mud and you you're creating like a thin film of mud uh throughout the ceilings and walls and what that does it helps with the flashing mm -hmm. so a lot of the times where there's a lot of natural sunlight coming in you're able to see where all the uh, nails and all the joints are the only yeah. way to eliminate that is to level five how many coats can you do or in plaster day? Sorry. Or plaster what you guys do. Yeah, so you guys don't even deal with that. But down here, down Screw here, the yeah, dust, level man. five. <laughs> I know, but we deal with the humidity and the, the moisture in the house. Yeah, I'll take that over dust all day. Oh, yeah. I'm not, no, there's yeah. a lot You're on the of fence? Dust. Huh? You just rolled your eyes. You're so you fence. guys are basically taping and finishing sanding, and there's once no it's sanding. sanded, then you're doing your you're rolling it on? Oh. Yeah, so between every coat, you have to do a, uh, a good – um brush Knock down, down. Yeah. yeah you you have to brush down all the lap marks all the whatever so it doesn't flash there's no humps uh that flash over your second coat third coat yeah but you're doing a full sand and, a full then, sand. and, and then, then doing your level five and then sanding again and then sanding everything again when and then pretty much the level five you have to hand sand everything yeah. by hand with a light i, I thought uh, my, you're saying hand sand meaning by hand or with like a, a no, so you festival you'll, thing? So, yeah, so I have a festival with a vac, but after yeah. that, you have to spot check everything. So you're pretty much hand sanding with a little sponge, you know, um, I getting see? all the lap marks, swirls, any type of imperfections. That... So this is level five. What about on these the spec these uh, tracks? You're doing a level okay, three? Yeah, and so then tracks will string, will string the house, first coat it, uh majority of times in the spring? same day we'll, yeah what'd you say spring oh string oh well, we run the tape when you tape the joints with the bazooka the automatic taper yeah that's so we'll stringing. do that first and then we'll coat over the joints and nails i still want to know what string means oh well, that it's called stringing a house taping the, no, that's the oh, slang. i, did, I just learned it. something yeah. all right yeah that's a slang when you string or you run the gun yeah what are you doing i'm stringing urban dictionary yeah. look, it, look it up <laughs> It's yeah. fun. Yeah, I thought so I, I used to do I totally ignored his uh everything else yeah, after so string, you Wait, just, so you, you after you stuck. string you what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you string the house and then you first coat everything. Okay. You know, you run the ten inch box yep. on the joints. I think you split your butt joints. Now. And then uh you use the nail spotter. If it's a track you you know, uh I was doing um I was doing piecework for about three years when I first started. So we would do about four houses a week um, on base. But if it's track, wow. you, you know, you're trying to quick turnover, quick turnover. So you run the nail spotter and then you, you have your apprentice, who's the lowest paid guy of the bunch, just pound in all the opihis. Opihis, uh, a local word. It's it's all the misfires, <laughs> you know, the, the screws that didn't hit the stud. That what are... does opihi translate to? Opihi is an actual, um, it's a... Um, it's a food that you can um, you can get <laughs> out of the water. We both turned our head like dogs. Yeah. yeah, Google search. Google search. It looks like an oyster almost. It's a crustacean. I don't want to get flagged. Oh, okay. 
Okay, yeah, that so that's sense. why I'll that's get why it's called opihis because they look like that on <laughs> the drywall. But <laughs> yeah, you pound in all your opihis and then um, you coat the corner bead details, all of that good stuff. You let that dry. Second day, you come in, you sand, you do it all over again, and you you run the angle box to save time on mm. all the corners. This so is on the a spray angle box, finish. the yeah, the angle box coats both sides at once. Yeah, uh, with mud. Where and then you. Go ahead. Sorry. Then you pick your angles, you and then the third day, you make it. You know, you touch up, you split all your butt joints, uh, repick the angles, make it look nice, and then you sand, mask, and spray. And that's just what? What is the spray? Again, a liquefied mud. Yeah, it's like a thin, thinned, thinned out, out yeah. uh, all-purpose mud. Watered down. Yeah. And then it just, you know, it it uh, seems like plastic sprays it onto so the wall. Much easier. I know it's it's one. I, I, that's what I don't it, understand. It's a way. I think it's way faster than uh, what you guys have to do. Whoa! As far as the Excuse me? the plaster. <laughs> I mean, we right? hang. All right, say we're doing a kitchen remodel. So hanging's the they, same. They would hang. Yeah, the hanging's yeah. the same. After that, they're. But you guys have to. Uh, so. Do you guys have to? You pretty much plaster over everything, right? Well, scratch you, and then you plaster. You put a scratch everything. and then yeah. plaster. Is it just one coat after yeah, yeah. the scratch coat? Yeah. And then I do mean, they sand or no? They just no, uh, no they kind of just wet. It's like glass, they, brother. They rub it out. It, it looks burnished. perfect. Yeah, it's burnished. So they <laughs> oh, just go wow. back and water and, and burnish it until it's, You're gonna, it's done. No drywall after this podcast. All yeah. plastic. <laughs> Imagine if we shifted the entire country to blue board plastic. <laughs> That's never going to happen. I remember the biggest. I was. I'm trying to remember my tip before I forget it. Do your guys price it so, per sheet? God, God, <laughs> Tyler, don't let him forget. <laughs> what did he say? No, he was I, trying to remember his point, and then you uh, were so like, I, "When I started, I only I was taught. I, I lose my train of thought, and it's gone forever." I was going to talk about credit lines earlier, and that went. Whew. Um, no. Um, when I started in the industry we were taught how to do drywall. That's all we ever did. So we like, we'd skim old houses. You'd, you'd come in with the buttons and you'd, you'd screw them all in and, and fix the horsehair plaster that was there and sc- coat all these things. So I'd have like my Wait, stilts. What's a button? You know, a little, the little button. Plaster washers. Yeah. It's a little button. And uh, you'd, that way, if you were to screw, I'll send a, you a picture of if, one. If you Thank screw, you. if you screw a screw, a regular <laughs> screw into, into a horsehair plaster wall yeah. to suck it in, yeah. it won't do anything. It'll just get just sucked tracks. right in. Yeah. Is so it like if, a Raptor? No, it's like staple? a little, it's like a, it's like a little, Hold um, on, I'll show you a picture. It's of like one. a little metal washer. It's wide. So when it goes in, it actually pulls the plaster in with it. Okay. So, oh, we, cause if it would separate. Yeah. So oh, you're okay. trying to suck in these little bubbles that happen I when it's separated. You. you do that and you skim it. So it like. I remember we do like these jobs in Newton where we would, I'd get on stilts and my partner would be below me. He'd do all the low spots. Amazing, right? I'd do the high spots. Yeah. And for the short guy, oh, yeah, that's okay. a button. Oh, like a Schluter washer. Oh. Like that. Yeah. They used to be called buttons before Schluter tagged them. Yeah. Um, but no, we do all that. I think skim it all. Too. I think the biggest, <laughs> the, I think the biggest trick I was taught by one of my, the older guys that were there was like when we used to do like our uh, tape joints over new new drywall was to like wet a sponge and do like instead of like a, a dry sand we would do like a wet sand he'd call it and it was like oh. it was like heaven yeah so you'd we'd <laughs> mix I don't feel good. like that really I've never works. done drywall so it I'm did work extremely interesting it, Guillermo, totally. you can tell him that that doesn't really work <laughs> that you works oh, we, it right. we wet sand like patches when we have to like tie in uh, like if it's a patch and we have to match the existing texture or whatnot. Okay. We feather yeah, out the, the to, edges. If you're trying to make a texture, yeah. you can put a sponge on it. <laughs> it's going smooth. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tyler. <laughs> Crushing my dreams. I'm not buying it. Uh, but you, John, you probably know price per sheet for oh, your um, blue board and plaster on a bigger house. Uh, no, I try not to look at the numbers. <laughs> I, I get that number like it's between for our houses we're probably thirty eight thousand for pla- board and plaster and that's how many sheets four hundred five and four eighty five hundred somewhere in there if I had a and what what would yours be Guillermo? uh for five hundred if it's level five it'd be like like forty the last house we did is forty nine uh, pl- labor pl- plaster. forty nine thousand plaster it is forty nine thousand. I'm, ta- I'm talking labor. board and plaster. Labor, no, labor, labor. Yeah, that's seventy six bucks a sheet yeah. for your price. It's a steal. 
<laughs> All right, so plaster it is, guys. The long, this is what everyone has been asking. Why do you guys do plaster? Because it's faster, it's cheaper. The only other question we glass. get we get more of is why do you strap your ceilings? That yeah, I don't know. I either. still don't get that. I don't. Do what hey, I don't hey, get about you strapping it? your ceilings. <clears throat> try it once. No, is that they're allowed to run wires? I agree them. with that. That I is do agree silly. with that. that. I think that's stupid. So they, they're, they, for you some don't? reason, where Nick and John are, they strap their ceiling. So after everything's framed, even yeah. when it's brand new, they go back and put up basically furring strips across their whole ceiling. It, it came from when they, you know, when they built homes before and they'd use that to level out the ceiling. They would shim everything yeah. down. Yeah. We just never got yeah, rid of they it. They still do it. But it's they're like allowed TGI's to run. Perfect height. Al- so strap you now it. have three quarters of an inch chase. Because it runs perpendicular to their joist, you now have a three-quarter yeah. inch chase, and they allow them to run electrical cables. Which is through, weird through because it. by oh, electrical wow. code, you have to be an inch and a quarter. Yeah. From the backside of drywall. Or the, yeah. They yeah. they also put strapping in because before they used to do this crisscross bracing, they'll keep your joist straight. Right. And when they remove that, instead of doing blocking, you could put strapping down. So you're basically. Yeah, you I do. I I there. agree, Tyler. I don't. I'm not, I'm. I never like seeing that. Yeah, that and we've hit mind. and we've hit it. We've hit. Does that know, help goes like, with and... sound? Because I know, like in Canada, they do a lot of resilient channels. It's similar to, to help that. with like vibration. Or does that? They're, you they're just that cowboys helps? up there. We can't yeah. explain it. <laughs> we have no idea. Yeah, it's not. No. Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, it creates. I guess it creates. No, it doesn't really create an air gap at all. You're still directly attached. Well, no, it does create. Oh, uh, yeah, it's weird. So you, you're strapping, and then you're running your ceiling. St- first because it's going to run into your top plate otherwise you have a fire code issue yeah yeah otherwise so are you got are you guys framing your interior partitions strapping after before no usually you strap and load then do bearing the yes non load so then bearing. you're strapping everything then running your interior partitions non load yeah. bearing yeah bearing, yeah well tyler's yeah. judging us right now with that pause <laughs> i i it just i don't know we've never done it Next time, next next house, yeah. no strap. We'll go no strap when you go yeah, strap. Yeah, then you don't you don't have as many as many as many. I think we lost them. Yeah, did you guys hear it, Tyler? No. You look super Man, sleepy. Kick ass. <laughs> <laughs> Man, my audio. All I saw was this. <laughs> maybe maybe he's just pretending that it chopped off. He's like, hey guys. <laughs> No, I wait, hold on. No one's ever done that Sleep. in the podcast. No. <laughs> but, but Man, pre- do I wish this was a video because that was hilarious. <laughs> you pretended to, to cut out. That was awesome. Uh, I said, now now we don't have, now with when you strap your ceiling, you don't have as many Oshishis or whatever the heck they're called. Oh, peepees. Oh, shishis. Oh, peepees. Oh, peepees. Close enough. Yeah. Well, dude, this was. Uh, this was awesome. We truly appreciate your time, even though it's way earlier over there than it is. Oh here. yeah. What time you do they? Go back, you can go, go back, back to work. work. Yeah. yeah you definitely, he's on lunch. Uh, I got I got about five missed calls. I'm gonna return these right after. There you go. <laughs> it's nine yeah. o'clock. It's four. Nine oh, o'clock. Yeah. yeah. You got Tyler's a couple more hours left. In. What time does yeah. it get dark there? It doesn't. It starts. It's like um, Alaska. It starts to get dark uh, during the winter time, a little bit earlier, but around like seven, seven ten. Mm, that's nice. Wait, yeah. Do you guys change your clocks? No. No. It's another no. reason to move to Hawaii. Yeah, I think we yeah. should. We're, we're gonna visit and then try to pop up a show. Oh yeah, come down. So we, we held. Uh, we held like a, I put together a little uh, drywall Olympics type of game type I'll of come thing. Come in last, I year. promise. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm down. That, that was pretty cool. The guys from uh marshalltown came down they came down from iowa uh they bought a bunch of prizes and whatnot and we had a lot of fun but we're gonna hold it again this year and i got a hold of uh habitat for humanity so what we're gonna do is we're gonna volunteer and compete at the same time it's gonna be a lot of fun what, um, give us the details awesome. you know when it is um uh, no i don't have the we didn't we're, we're kind of have to play it by ear because the way that habitat for humanity builds they don't have like a set sure well, when you get that information, make sure you hit up one yeah, of us. Yeah, totally. Tyler. I'll let you guys know. You guys can come down and host it. 
<laughs> I was just going to offer to promote it, but sure. I like can, where your head's at. Put us, put us in touch with Marshalltown and we will. Yeah, yeah. 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 That was awesome. You guys can host it. I was it. like, hey, we're going to promote it. He's we'll like, get yeah, you, you guys can yeah. host it. Yeah, I was beer. like, we'll get you back on. <laughs> All right, last question for Uh-oh. you. You prepared? Do you eat spam? Oh, of course. What? Spam, eggs, and rice. Yeah, man. That's the... Uh, is that a thing? That's a local delicacy. Okay, what My is what is spam? <laughs> what is delicacy? <laughs> what is spam? Spam is spare parts of other animals. No, no but <laughs> <laughs> it's a mixture of pork. It's kind of like what is hot dogs? You know? Yeah. You kind of uh, don't want to know. It's, it's like hot, dog hot dogs. Right? Hot dogs that taste like cat food in can shape. <laughs> No, I mean, it's good. Like, uh, you know, I think it's an acquired taste. Some people don't like it. But it's like wine. Down here, down here, you go to your local Monopoly like man, <laughs> you buy some musubis and pork cash, and you're, yeah, you're happy. They love, they love yeah. spam down there. Yeah. God, the last 20 minutes of this podcast is gold. Yeah. <laughs> it's just straight gold. Anyone that's li- listen to this in reverse. <laughs> <clears throat> what's your uh, What's your Instagram? Uh, um. CS Drywall Hawaii. Awesome. Yeah. And where so else? What, how? What's is that the best way for people to find you or get a hold of you? Um. Yeah. CS Drywall Hawaii. It got a link to our YouTube. Um. I'm pretty sure my number is attached to that. Uh, but yeah, we're we're pretty active on that. Um. We try to post daily. Uh. Have some fun with it. So if you guys are a GC in Oahu and looking for a good drywall guy. Or if you, yeah. ha- or even better, if you're a plaster. commercial GC. No, going for plaster. <laughs> if you want plaster. Oh yeah, <laughs> hit us up. We'll relocate. <laughs> we'll bring we'll bring the blue board. Sorry, I thought you were going a different direction. My, yeah. bad. My bad. Um, <laughs> and if you are looking to get in the trades in drywall, you know who to reach out to. Check them out on Instagram. Awesome. Thanks, man. Well, I appreciate it, man. Oh. All right. You guys have a great night. We'll stay in touch. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Okay. Talk to you guys later. See ya. See ya. How do you hang up? (laughs) (laughs) Keep that. Please keep that. That that. was awesome. (laughs) We get a uh, a surprise guest in the studio. Seriously, I thought that was a huge mouse. (laughs) (laughs) Chris Vaughn from Cape Cod Lumber. I'm setting him up, and I don't, he doesn't even have a mic in front yeah, of him. Yeah, we can take, say whatever we want right now. No mic. He's, he's literally listening oh, yeah. across. He's doing the, the Tyler thing. John, can you share a mic? Yeah, or should we I can just one? give it up. Actually, I, I think I got one real quick. You don't want to get real friendly? <laughs> yeah, we can share. This is how we start. This, yeah, this is episode one. Uh, Chris, what's up? Not much. How what's you doing? With you? Great. Appreciate you uh, coming out at nine o'clock. This you were is, sick last week. This is late. Well, when else are we gonna do it? I don't it? know. Take a lunch break like that guy does and do it then. He's in Hawaii. Yeah, Life lunch, is different. Lunch there. all day. They don't really work there. That's unfair. It's all. <laughs> um, you were sick last week. I was. I think everyone got sick because it got so cold so quickly. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Like yeah, I. That's got, a that's a myth. I got I got two different emails today. Hey, sorry for the late reply. I got sick last week. Yeah, that's probably just coincidental. Maybe. You don't really get sick from it being cold. That's like a huge urgent urban legend. Everyone oh, knows that. Here we that. go with urban legends. Everyone knows that. <laughs> well, Tyler's getting sick next week. Dude, you got- I've been I'm sick my whole life. I got kids. Different type of sickness. Mm-hmm. You guys uh sponsored the podcast last week. You get, did. Did you give it a listen? Yeah. Brent is a, an amazing human. He's good. He's good. We uh we had the chance to sit down with him and keep talk talking after that podcast and I hope I know until they threw us out. Yeah, we actually got thrown out of the restaurant. I heard you're taking all the boral off your house. <laughs> That's it's actually already gone. Okay. <laughs> um someone messaged me, it was like, You guys are wrong, that stuff shrinks a quarter inch. I'm like, quarter inch is pretty aggressive. I don't think P V C shrinks a quarter inch. I've heard people having issues with boral but shrinking. My understanding is it's, it's if John Marley said this is that if you don't protect it while it's laying down on the site, yeah. that's when you have issues with it. As long as it stays dry up until the point you install it, you're fine. Yeah. I 
It's probably that it's like wet and then you install it and it dries out. I have I installed mine. The whole front of my house is clap. I did all the trim, windows, corner boards, then did the V groove and I mitered it and everybody threw shots at me. What'd you did you glue the miter? I glued it, yeah. With what? Polyurethane yeah. glue. Um polyurethane glue. I did screw it all with the cortex and then I nailed all my trim off. Um but that V groove that was mitered and the historic still that wrapped around, zero movement. Zero gap in any of it. Did you did you cock the? Uh, trim? But it had a gap in it when you first installed it. Watch your tone. No. <laughs> okay. It was perfect. It, honestly, I, I everyone started throwing shots, so I kept checking it and checking it. Winter, middle of summer, none of it moved. None of those miters. We moved. did the same thing at uh, at our Newton job. We mitered all the clap, and everyone's like, "That's gonna break. It's gonna shrink. It's gonna move." Blah blah blah. But like you said before, I also covered all my right. Boral when it, it arrived, it came in like a I don't want to say a sleeve or a cover from Boral, and I left it that way. Yeah. I never left it exposed. Right, and I think that's the issue people have. But going back, you so you guys sponsored the podcast, so thank you, thank you. Um, but we have an event coming up, and we got you in the studio. Yeah, you get it's it's a uh, get gotta, right up to it. You got to eat the mic. We call eat it. the mic. Eat the mic. Uh, but I'm going to stop talking because I'm really good at talking and let you talk about the event we got coming up. So December 12th is our CCL Build On Expo, uh, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, you guys will be there. You're speaking on uh, attracting, developing, and retaining new, younger talent, um, which as a supplier, that's a huge issue that we see in the trades. doesn't seem like a lot of younger people want to get into the business. Um, so that's one piece of it. We're going to have, I think it's, close to 50 vendors now are going to be there showing off products. So there'll be a bunch of wow. vendors. Yeah. So we have a trade show. Is the mic good now? <laughs> John's moving the mic. You're a little quiet, but that's okay. You I know. can't hear myself. I feel like it's good. I hear him either. fine. <clears throat> um, so yeah, we've got about 50 vendors on a trade show floor. They'll have booths. And then throughout the entire day, we're going to have educational speaker sessions going the whole time. So Sean Van Dyke's there. Um, he's going to be doing a keynote speech uh, it's titled Finding Unicorns. Yeah. Actually, I think I butchered the name. It's actually Hunting Unicorns is what he called it. So, <laughs> Sorry, Sean. Didn't mean to call it that. It's now called Finding Unicorns. Though. <laughs> um, so what he's talking about is pretty much that, you know, a lot of people in the, in the trades are trying to find, you know, everybody needs help. Right. And, and they're trying to find that perfect employee they need to find that master carpenter or you know somebody who's paying attention to detail and, and they care about what they're doing and you're trying to find that person and if that person exists out there they probably already have a job well not only that but they own their own company right maybe <laughs> but not only that i, I i'm gonna guess because I, I have not seen him talk about this but i'm gonna guess that that talk is going to be less about finding that person mm -hmm. than and more so about finding a person that you can turn into a unicorn. Exactly, yeah. And that's is. what people keep <clears throat> forgetting. And I'm actually, I'm give, I'm, have, I'm bringing my entire team there. Sweet. Because we're going to get on, on we're going to be talking about, like you said, uh, developing, retaining, and, and finding youth talent. Right. And that's why I want my team there. Because, you know, people have reached, said to me, oh, you're lucky you, you found the right person. It's like, well, there's 15 of us now. And it's not like I'm out there, quote unquote, hunting unicorns right. i'm bringing people that have a passion for it and and developing the exactly and helping them develop yep. yeah yeah so that's that's mainly what he's talking about is get a good person get a good employee that is willing to learn they're they're dedicated they they show up for work they you know have all those good characteristics and then we have to train them into that master carpenter right or, or whatever you know whatever it is that you need well we gave him the the formula on brent's podcast and becoming a master carpenter true <laughs> i heard that <laughs> i forget what it was i'm sure so do I. Older. <laughs> sharp chisels oh that's right yeah, yeah. that's right the whoever has sharp tools. His own chisel. yeah and it's funny when he <laughs> said that i'm like yeah i've definitely always just bought a new one it's funny because <laughs> i i have i have stones to sharpen my chisels like 10 feet from me right now you're a master. So we know who the master carpenter is in the air. Um, then he's so also, he's doing two, right? He's doing two. So he's doing that's that's the keynote speech, and then he's doing a workshop as well um, to talk about selling value over price. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest 
um, objections that, you know, contractors get. You're going out, you're quoting a job, you, you're talking to a homeowner, and then what do they say a lot of times? The price is too high sure. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was one time I was in our store, and I was talking to a contractor, and he's saying, Chris, you know, I just I quoted out this, this decking for a customer, and the decking is like this much money. He's like, I, I wouldn't pay that much money for a deck. I can't go to them and tell them it's going to be – you know, 15 grand for a deck. That's ridiculous. And I said, why your labor is worth that much just because they picked a product that's expensive. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean you should discount your labor. Your labor is valuable. funny. We've all talked about that. It's like when we do a budget or an estimate and we get to the bottom number and we're like, Oh damn. Yeah. You know, cause it's like how, like I gotta, I, and you immediately, like you immediately go into this thought, like I price something wrong or I need to figure out how to sit, like pull the price down. Right. And, but you're right. It's why, it's like this is what they're asking for. exactly so if that's what they want and they want it done and they they have trust in you as a craftsman to do it right mm -hmm. then you should absolutely get paid for that um you always see those things that come up that people say you know this job only took two days you're not paying me for the two days you're paying me for the 30 years it took so sure. i can actually do it in two days yeah so um a lot of memes on that oh yeah I've seen a lot of those <laughs> yeah. they're coming up quite a bit um, and then you get, uh, I think, what, Amy and Brian? Yep, Amy and Brian are doing a uh, discussion about how an interior designer can add value to your project. Cool. So they've worked together on a few projects um, over the past year or two, I think. Yeah. So, and, you know, there, there's, it's the same thing with, with the price thing. A lot of people think they hear interior designer and they're like, that's going to add to the budget. Sure. You know, I can't, you know what, I'm going to wing it. I'm going to design this kitchen myself. I'm going to design the molding and everything myself. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> so it's, um, but the, the end goal is to make sure you have a homeowner who's happy with what they got. So when they walk, when you walk away from the project, they look at it and say, wow, I'm really glad that I hired that person to do that. John, what? But beyond that, I think we're talking about the client in that, but I also think as a builder, we can, we can basically use so much of our time by managing the project, managing the, the expectations, managing the subs, that when it comes to design, our bandwidth is maxed out. Hmm. And, yeah, you can do that for a certain scale. But then when you build your business to a certain point, you have to relinquish those tasks to somebody else that's skilled. So I think having that designer on board, it does, like, picking paint colors. I can use the excuse of being colorblind, but honestly... I shouldn't be touching that stuff. We lost Tyler again. It's all good. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's the same thing. That, you know, we have, you know, homeowners will come to us and ask us questions on, you know, can you build a house? And it's like, no, there's there's people for that, you know? And it's we, we can only answer so many questions. Sure. Same thing as John says, you know, when it comes to interior design and stuff like that, there's professionals that do that for a living. And they definitely add a ton of value to right. the project. And then Gary Striegel is going to be there. He's doing yep. four one-hour workshops. He's doing four one-hour workshops. I've on, memorized uh, your email. Yeah, you did, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> i got to keep pulling my phone out to look at the schedule. Um, but, yeah, so he's doing four one-hour workshops on um, fine carpentry. He's done JLC shows, writes for Fine Home Building Magazine. So, again, the main theme of the sh the expo is education and sure. and trying to help contractors become better at their uh profession how, how many uh registrations right now 250 nice yeah that's a good jump yeah it is a good jump it is a good we jump. got uh a month right three weeks three from weeks? thursday Are you nervous no not at all but i'm taking i'm taking <laughs> the lying. day after <laughs> off <laughs> that, that <laughs> oh so you're nervous for the 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 end of it no no, no. um so we're the goal is five hundred, right? Yeah, yeah, we're looking to get five hundred people. Is uh, is that a personal goal, or is that what the like everyone in your office is like? Hey, Chris, it's gonna, it's a better have five. It's a personal there. goal. Now it's the quota. Sure. <laughs> because I opened my mouth and said, "This is how many people I want there." Okay, you better get that many people there then. Nice. <laughs> well, I know. I mean, that's a good jump since we last yeah. spoke. And Nick set the bar even higher. We're both taking our old trucks to the uh, the expo. Yeah. Yeah, mine will be I ready. I haven't announced that I have an old truck, John. Oh. Now everyone knows. <laughs> you you put it on me to get my truck up and I running did. so it would be at the expo, so mine will be done. So, John, you bought an F100 like? 1969, yeah. A year ago? When we started the company. 
two, two years year, ago. Two years ago, you yeah, bought a 1969 painful. F100. Yep. And I've been giving you crap forever. Yep. And two months ago, I bought a 1968 it's C10. Turned, it's turned into a brag session for Nick. It did, yeah. <laughs> it did. And I dropped it off, and I had new brakes put on it. And I full tune up. And I literally drive it twice a week, like 100 miles a day. Because I'm just, and, I'm, and I texted John, I'm like, I'm like, dude, you got to get this thing fixed. And he's like, I know. I'm like, all right, here's Pat's number. He will fix it. And I was like, you know what? Cape Cod Lumber Expo. We're driving him. And, he's, and he texted me. He goes, dropping the truck off of your boys. Go, December 12th. We're gonna be so rolling. getting brakes, getting rims and tires, and getting it all set up. I'm getting mine lettered. So game on. Yeah, I'm not lettering mine. <laughs> Incognito. So if you have an old car, bonus points if you roll up in an old car. Just got a new Tacoma. <laughs> Not going to help. <laughs> um, and then, so we're, ta- we're going back. Well, and we're going to be talking, myself, John, Tyler, with Ella Brook from yep. Fast and Master, who we uh, we know. We know him. Uh, he, he's going to be grilling us with some questions about what we're doing. I think Tyler's cleaning up the studio. Um <laughs> But what we're doing to attract and develop and maintain, whether it's in our own company or, you know, even beyond that. Right. And you guys, it's an interesting group because you you said you have, what, 15 employees now? John. I think John said it last podcast. It's like for the first time we realized that we all come from like each position, John being management, me being management carpentry. Tyler being strict carpentry. Right. It's like we're hitting the three most common dynamics exactly. in, the, in in being like a, a business owner or in this industry, <laughs> which is was an interesting kind of realization. Yeah. So that, I mean, it's going to be an interesting conversation because, like you said, you guys are going to be able, to, a lot of people will be able to identify with that. Sure. You know, whereas if it was just you talking, some people are going to be like, well, I don't have 15 guys. I only need one. Right. Where, you know, they'll, with all three of you guys talking, they're going to be able to get something out of yeah. it. Yeah. What about food, drinks? Do we, bring, do we have to pack a lunch? Light, light snacks <laughs> and continental <laughs> breakfast. So I'm finding out more and more that on the, uh, the first thing that I have to do the next time we have this is make sure I have the beer. <laughs> because that's the You don't question. have beer? We don't have beer. It's nine to four. You can't serve beer at nine. What? Contractors? It's, they told me they didn't like beer or something like that. I, I, I tried to argue with them. Well, I mean I guess nine to four is a would be an odd that would you would you would deter like a lot of people would be focused on that. By the time it's you guys social hour. by the time you guys got up there, then it probably wouldn't be so good. Yeah, that's true. It's because you guys had a meetup. Yeah, and that was different. That was, that was be, different. Yeah, yeah. so and you, that was more yep. casual. Um, but so continental breakfast. So yeah. that means like fruit cups, fruit cups, coffee, mimosas, pastries. mimosas, and then Old a light champagne, light, light snacks at lunchtime. Yeah. So maybe Throughout we should pack a lunch. There's plenty of restaurants nearby as well. So do we all just get takeout? Like forty cars roll in with takeout? Yeah. Huh? Grubhub. <laughs> Grubhub. Uber Eats. There's plenty of options. Fantastic. Uh what else should we know? Uh there's the website. Everybody you know, go on and register on the website. Cape Cod Lumber dot com forward slash build dash on dash expo. You're getting good at that. I am. I practice it. My mirror. What's your it's free, uh, right? Uh, we mentioned that. I got kicked off the internet. Sorry. We don't. And Tyler, you bring it up. You bring it up all the time, which is important because I think a lot of people keep thinking that they're paying for this. What's that? It's free. Did it you is. ignore Tyler? Yeah. No, no, no. Sorry. <laughs> was, John distracted me. Um, it's free. The yeah. event is free. Yeah. It's completely right. free. Hence the fruit cups, but that's fine. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but it is. No. It's free, but you have to register so we can hit that 500 number. I'm sure people will roll in without being yeah, registered. Yeah, I mean, nobody's going to be turned away if they didn't register. We'll just, we'll, we will have a registration table there. Mm-hmm. We just ask them to register there. Do name um, tags or anything? No name tags. Um, you know, we just, we want it to be as easy as possible. People sure. come in, register, get inside. Cool. Go what they're there for. Um, what is Cape Cod Lumber? It's a lumber yard. Oh, lame. <laughs> On Cape Cod. There was your one no. shot. So. That blowing up. <laughs> We are the best, the premier lumberyard on that street. 
on, on the South Shore. On the South Shore. Eastern Seaboard. Eastern Seaboard. No. I've never so, heard anyone say Eastern Seaboard. Uh, you'd have now. Yeah, I did. <laughs> we're, uh, so we're a lumberyard on South Shore, Massachusetts. Um, we are not on Cape Cod. So give you a little brief history name? on that. Getting there. Getting there. So I interject a lot. All right, all right, all right. I've listened to the podcast. <laughs> I've read the reviews. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny can build out everything, and I ask too many questions. Yep. Um, so the original location was in Abington. It was called Cape Cod Wrecking and Salvage. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything, it was on Route 18 in Abington. Everything on 18 was Cape Cod this and Cape Cod that. You got Cape Cod Cafe, Pizza, Cape Cod Auto, whatever. Um, it was one of the main routes to Cape Cod. So if you were going there, that's where you you drove down that street pretty much. This imagine is imagine the- driving to the Cape for the first time and be like, am I in Cape Cod already? Well, like everything is Cape Cod around me. <laughs> that was fast. As far <laughs> as everybody's concerned, if I you're lived south in Brockton, of Quincy. I thought it was much further than this. Yeah. I've got a friend that thinks south of Quincy is Cape Cod. Um, it's not. So... For my whole life, I had a Cape house, and only to find out that it's in Marion, which is before the bridge. <laughs> and my wife has made it very clear that that is not a Cape house. <laughs> Close. You're, it's, we'll count it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Thanks, it was Cape Cod Wrecking and Salvage, though. Uh, and then uh, the current uh, principal owner of the company, his father, bought it, um, changed the name to Cape Cod Lumber. And what they used to do was basically go to knock down buildings, salvage the lumber, pull all the nails out, clean it up, and resell it. So this still is when? In the 50s. 1958. I did that in like the 90s working for my dad. We just didn't resell it. We just reused it. That's like such a big industry right now. Yeah, I know. We should bring it back. Do it, no? No, now we don't. Okay. Now it's all perfectly So we were, we were doing reclaimed wood before it was reclaimed wood. Okay. Um, so, and then we evolved from there. Uh, you know, now we sell new lumber. We don't go and take the salvage stuff and resell it. Um, but one of the things that we pride ourselves on is quality and, and the people that we have. So I tell people all the time, you know, we may not be the, the cheapest place on the block, sure. but what we pride ourselves on is that when you get a lift of lumber from us, you're not going to be sitting there saying, okay, this one's bad, this one's bad. Oh, I can use this one. How long have you one. been in the new facility? Uh f- almost five years now yeah, 2013 and, and that's one so, thing almost it, six years actually it's super organized clean and yeah neat. yeah and that and that goes that goes a long way john all i keep seeing is john's hand pop into the screen <laughs> either to fix a microphone or show pictures no <laughs> he's showing us pictures of that stuff in hawaii what are they oh oh peas oh oh peas something like that oh, oh. <laughs> I couldn't read what you wrote, but yeah, oh. ba- basically. So we're not just lumber. So one of the, the <laughs> oh, John, John's feeding. Yeah, John's queuing. John's queuing running the podcast. He's way over here just holding up signs. Um, so you know, we, we don't sell just lumber. So one of the slogans this year uh, in some of our marketing was not on Cape Cod, not just lumber. So we sell lumber, doors, windows, trim, uh, decking. Uh, cabinets and cabinets kitchens you know pretty much everything that goes into a house cool. from the f- above the foundation less plumbing and electrical mm-hmm. so what's the any uh any grand plans to expand your facility or locations or no we actually had two facilities at one point uh so we had the abington location and we had a location in mansfield and you know uh the word transfer was like a swear in the, in the building because mm. it was just you know we were sending product back and forth you guys were over near like home that. people right uh Mansfield? we were do you know where boston cedar is yeah that was right us Hobie, probably, we yeah. actually rented um yeah national lumbers yeah, there too. exactly yeah. yeah so we consolidated into one sorry <laughs> <laughs> another lumber company's over there different lumber company yeah. though um <laughs> so we consolidated so into mad. one location in Abington and uh, the original location we were in, it was just, it was too small. Sure. Pulling a, a tractor trailer out onto Route 18 was like taking your life into your own hands too. So um, so we looked at the uh, property that we are on now, which was a driving range. So you still find golf balls and stuff if That's you fine. walk out past the, the yard and everything. Um, but yeah, so we, we just made it, 
we were able to start from scratch and really build it the way that we wanted it. You said it was organized. That was one of the things that we had in mind when we built it is we want everything undercover so contractors can come pick up material, drive in, not be sitting out in the rain or anything like that. Um, and it's just, it, it's, we have enough land that we don't really need to expand. And You got a big roof too. Yeah, and yeah. You have, you have solar, solar up there? panels up Is it top. all solar there? Pretty much. Like, yeah. You're not off the grid, are you? No, no. Okay. So we we actually feed it back into the grid. Oh wow! So we generate power for you, the community. That's we're, awesome. We're not powering ourselves. Oh, you're not powering yourself no, at all. No, it's all going back. Yeah, National Grid actually owns that. Okay. So we lease it to them, and then we generate power for the the rest of the community. Fantastic. Yeah. Cool. So December twelfth. Yeah. Lombardos. Where's Lombardos? It's like right down the street. Okay, the guys listening have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, well, <laughs> that's true. Don't tell them where the Batcave is. <laughs> it's in Randolph, Massachusetts. So, uh, <laughs> Is that the place right off 24 and 93? Yeah, you can see split? the big sign. It's got the Vincent's big stairway. Nightclub. Yep, yep. Vincent's Nightclub is, okay. is underneath it. So if people stay late and they decide they want to rip it up all night, then go I've for it. I've never been there. Is it good? Me neither. Oh. <laughs> 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 I'll let you tell me the day after. Everyone the, that the, is uh, driving expo. a distance, they're like, I'm, I mean, I'm definitely just going to stay at Vincent's Nightclub. <laughs> I have nowhere else to go. <laughs> well, December 12th, 9 to 4, it's a free event. Yeah. You have to register on the website. Uh, your Instagram handle Cape Cod Lumber. Cape Cod Lumber. Make the it link's easy. in there. Yep. Um, also on our page. And it's also on our page. Perfect. So, again, Gary Striegler is going to be there, Sean Van Dyke, Amy Lynn, Brian Sharon. Myself, John, Tyler, Tom Ellibrook, uh, so far 250 other like-minded contractors, yep. and hopefully another 250. Maybe Vincent will come. Uh, oh, yeah. And <laughs> Vincent, I think, <laughs> pro probably not around. Uh, and, and we may pop up and do a live podcast there. Cool. Uh, see what we can uh, squeeze into the day. Perfect. Fantastic. Chris, thanks for swinging by. Thank you. I know you. it's late past the bedtime. It is, definitely. We're going to wrap this up. Sounds good. Uh, before I do, we always do the reviews and make sure. Let's have no Chris one's... read the reviews. Oh. Chris, I like read that. I'll read them. All right. Everyone's always like, I'm not reading them. I will not censor any of it. No, you don't, you don't <laughs> censor it. <laughs> All right, let's see. How about I pick the reviews? I'm kidding. We have. Um, you can pick. We do the top three, the first three. So first you get three. three to pick from. All right. <coughs> do you read who it's from, or do we keep that anonymous? Yeah. All right. So Pine State Builders, great podcast, five stars. Every Monday I look forward to listening and learning something, and every Monday I'm not disappointed. So far, so good. I believe that this podcast has been helpful as I navigate running my business, working on projects, and how I scale my projects. You guys are more helpful than any than you probably know. In fact, last week, John took a few minutes out of his day for a phone call to talk about contracts and offer great advice. Every week, I learn something from all three of you and the guests, and it provides items that I, provides items to think about moving forward, both professionally and personally. Thank you, Jay. Jay, I'm sorry. For I just, I, thank you. I'm going to say your last name wrong is what I was going to say. Uh, from Pine State Builders. I think it's, I think it's Horahan. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Carer. That's what I think Jay it says. Horahan. John even called me to wish me a happy birthday. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Next, Great Craftsman. This was on Wednesday from Menno Peachy. Five stars. You guys are awesome. Yeah, all three of you guys love every podcast. I definitely get a lot of advice from you guys, and I know I'm not the only craftsman with growing pains. The variety of guest, guests you bring on is great. Last one. It's another five-star. You guys kill it. <laughs> uh, from, I can't even, Alf Dog Peter. Sweet. Uh, love listening to you guys, your guys' show every week. Been a fan for the past few months and trying to catch up on the missed episodes. The more I listen, the more I want to the more I want to leave my mundane retail career and join a house building team. But for now, my fo I focus my effort on a small DIY house project 
and small woodworking projects, cabinets, and small furniture to fulfill my passion for building stuff. Keep up the great work. I've truly enjoyed every episode. I'll keep listening and following you guys on IG. Love looking at all of the great work you guys do. Thank you. That's a, that's a solid week. A little disappointed no one made fun of John, but... Seriously. <laughs> It's the worst week, worst week yet. It's you gotta funny. go easy on it's funny. Stephen Borrell off his house. Uh, <laughs> last week I was saying how if I ever gave up construction, I'd go into retail just so I could prove that it you could do your job with without a puss on your face because the amount of people that work that and just are so terrible at it. Um, random fun fact. As always, guys, you can find us online, <laughs> themoderncraftsman.org. Email us at info at themoderncraftsman.org. Uh, we read a handful of the reviews every week right off iTunes. Uh, John, what are we up to? 607. 607 reviews. We should just read all of them. All right. Maybe at just the Cape one... Cod Lumber event, we'll just get up and just <laughs> read all 600. <laughs> Ella Brooks is like, so what are you doing for the community? <laughs> so we have this great podcast from Pat. <laughs> uh, and then, as always, Instagram, the Perry Monte Craftsman. Appreciate you guys listening. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs>